Good morning, everybody. Um, it's 9.30 by that clock there, so we will start. Um, before we start the meeting, many of you will be aware of the sad passing of Councillor Graham Newman on the 28th of December 2022, following a short illness. Graham had been a Suffolk County Councillor for Felixstowe Coastal since 2005 and was a very active member of the Council, holding a number of chairmanships and cabinet appointments. He was also a Felixstowe Town Council, as, along with myself, and he was a member of this panel up until two years ago. It's for that reason that I felt it was appropriate to remember Graham today. My thoughts go with Jan and the family uh, at what was an incredibly difficult time for them all. Uh, and we wish them the best uh, as they come to terms with the tragic loss. Those of you, I know many of you have worked with Graham, uh, I can say uh, from personal experience, not only was he an exceptional councillor, a very fair man, but he very quietly got on with the job and gave superb advice. And I think the majority of the time, Graham didn't realise what valuable information and guidance he gave, certainly me and I'm sure everybody else. Um, having been mayor of Felix so for two years, I was, uh, I looked at Graham as a role model and, uh, and so it's incredibly sad that we have to have this eulogy today and we think of the family at the funeral next Friday. So could I ask you just to stand for a minute just so we can remember Graham. Lovely, thank you very much. Thank you, members, for that. This meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on the Council's YouTube channel whilst we're in public session. A record of the meeting will be made also available online after the meeting. Members of the public and the press may record, film, photograph or broadcast this meeting when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded provided due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance in line with the Council's published guidelines. Can I remind you please to speak clearly into the microphone and avoid placing things such as papers or IT equipment in front of the microphone so this will affect the quality. Can I also ask you to turn off your mobile phones and laptops onto silent please if you have not already done so. We are not expecting a fire drill, and in the event of an alarm sounding, please leave the room by, the, uh, by following the fire exit signs. Fire evacuation instructions can also be found on page four of the agenda. Before I move to item one, I know I've just got to turn my work phone off. <laughs> Lovely. I shall now move to agenda item one, which is public question session. There have been no questions received from members of the public. Item two is apologies for absence and substitutions. We have received apologies for absence from Councillor Caroline Page, who is being substituted by Councillor Inga Lockington, Councillor Tracy Green, who is being substituted by Councillor Edward Back, and Councillor Debbie Richards, who is being substituted by da uh, Councillor David Gold Goldsmith. May I extend a warm welcome to the, uh, the substitutes for today and thank you for making yourselves available. Agenda item three is the declarations of interest and, and dispensations. There have been no declarations received in advance of the meeting. If you wish to declare an interest now, please indicate by raising your hand. Moving on to agenda item five. You would all received a copy of the minutes. If any member wishes to comment on the accuracy of the minutes of the meeting held on the 2nd of December uh, 2022, please can I ask you to raise your hand now. Otherwise, I will take it that the panel is content to approve the minutes as a correct record. Got away with that, Susan? Well done, thank you. 
We now move on to the main item of the agenda, which is agenda item five. This provides the panel with the opportunity to consider and either support or veto the PCC's proposal for the policing precept for 23-24. I would draw the panel's attention to the areas of focus and key lines of inquiry which are set out on pages 11 and 12 of the agenda pack. Members should note, in order to be able to vote at the end of this item, there may, they must be present in the meeting room for the whole of the consideration of the item, depending on how long it goes on for, and th this meeting will finish at one o'clock uh, today anyway, but we, will, we may take a break if people think they need a comfort break before we reach a final decision, because I know people will want to vote on this. I would like to remind the panel that this item relates to the strategic financial direction of the constabulary over the next three years. I'm very conscious that there have been some significant and tragic incidents recently in both Haverhill and Ipswich. While these events have a significant impact on the victims' families and the wider community, they should be considered in the wider context of the policing, of the policing in Suffolk and this particular agenda item. I would like now to invite the PCC to introduce his proposals for the policing precept 2023-24. Um, thank you very much, Mark, and good morning, everybody. Just before I start, I would like to really echo your words about um, the sad passing of Councillor Graham Newman. He was a good friend, I think, to everybody in Suffolk, irrespective of politics, and I think um, he will, of course, be sadly missed. So, um, I think the decision regarding, or the recommendation regarding the precept um, for this year for the policing part of uh, everybody's council tax is by far the most difficult one I've had to do um, in the 10 years I've had the privilege of being in office. I also want to, well, not exactly remind everybody, but mention the turbulent times we live in, um, well, be it locally, nationally, you've mentioned the tragic incidents that we've had, and of course there was this um, other serious stabbing up at um, Ben Acre not very long ago. Um, but it's also, looking at the geopolitical situation, the war in Ukraine, the aggressive intent of China, and we can think of other rogue nations like North Korea, Iran, and so on. And I mention this, Chairman, because this, of course, does add to huge uncertainty of where we're going as we go forwards. And keeping Suffolk Constabulary on the right path, looking after everybody, fighting crime and preventing crime, more importantly, we all have a responsibility for that, is hugely, hugely important. We know areas are blighted with high levels of crime and so on, and it's absolutely essential that our constabularies are properly resourced and financed. So I just want to make a few points now um, going forward. We do have a very good constabulary. There is always room for improvement. I absolutely can guarantee that. There is no question about that. But if you look at the last HMIC report, um, the Peel inspections, Overall, it was a very, very good report. The one area that was singled out for improvement, of course, was on the contact and control room and engagement, and we'll come back to that later. A very uh, f uh, quick resume of where we are when we're looking at savings. As I've mentioned before, the collaboration we have um, with Norfolk is fundamental. That started before I was in post, but you will see in your papers on page 37 this year, we have saved over 22 million quid of taxpayers' money. That's probably the highest in the country as a proportion of our net revenue budget. Not every force does that, and I think we do need to be reminded of that. The other thing that is quite serious, uh, everybody, is the huge increase in demand for 999 calls. Nobody thought this time last year demand would go up by 21, I repeat, 21%. And it would be completely wrong if we were not able to fulfill our obligations when it comes to 999 emergency calls. And that's one of the reasons that we do need the extra funding. I would not for a moment suggest it if it were not absolutely necessary. I, by nature, do not like putting up taxes. And I think it may only be um, Peter who remembers the first two years I was in this position, we actually took the council tax freeze. So I haven't put it up every year. I know there have been big increases in the last um, four or five years. I am well aware of that, painfully well aware of that. 
but I can't in all honesty sit here as the police commissioner for Suffolk and put forward proposals that do not support the constabulary. That is really important, and I hope everybody remembers that. So if you look at your papers, you will see there is an ongoing savings program. Already in the medium-term financial plan, over £2 million is forecast to be saved. Well, not forecast, it will be delivered, and it has been over the last few years. If we again you look at some of the papers there, which I hope you have done, the legacy grants that we've had for some years have not gone up at all with inflation, £6.8 million. Had that gone up by inflation, maybe we'd be getting nine or £10 million now. So that's a shortfall in many ways that is inbuilt, and I do think that is wrong of the Home Office not to recognise that. We took the freeze grant as we were asked to do, going right back to the beginning, but there's been no compensation for the fact that we did do as we were asked. I hope you will remember that, please. So the fundamental issue here is that our funding has only gone up by about 1.8%. If you've got any uh, further questions on that, uh, my colleague Colette, um, our Chief Financial Officer, will be able to help answer those. But with the funding going up 1.8%, we all know that inflation at the moment is about 10%, thereabouts. And yes, we all hope it will come down, but I don't think it will come down to 1.8% by the time we're here this time next year. So where do you find that extra funding from? We're asking for a 6% increase, which is half the amount, roughly, that goes into the constabulary budget. So I hope you can do your quick bit of mathematical calculation to realise we are in a pretty difficult position here. Really important we recognise that. And anybody who thinks that it can't be supported I would ask them to reflect very seriously on what the consequences may be. It's been well documented about demand shoved onto the police from other parts of the public sector, which I think is unfair, unreasonable and unacceptable. We are not a mental health service. We are not an ambulance service. We are not there to look after social services, nor do we get any help from national highways on our very, very important road routes, the A14, A12 and parts of the A11. We continue to make our case to government with all the vigour we can. And any support you can give as councillors or ordinary citizens, please, please, please come to that, um, that aid. We really do need it. And it is distracting the police from this business of preventing crime and fighting crime. However, we are all happy to work together to come up with solutions, handing over responsibilities. But I can't sit here and just say we're tying up police officer time for hours on end in some of these areas. Why is that happening? What are the answers? And yet there will be pressure not to put the council tax up, which I absolutely agree with. But just think about the consequences if we start to erode that. These people, many of whom will be vulnerable, will fall through the net. That is not acceptable in a civilised society. The levels of fraud have jumped hugely. I've put forward proposals of Suffolk public sector leaders and I expect them to deliver. We're having a re-look at that. We've got support from the chairman of the safeguarding board. Fraud affects everybody. It isn't just a business crime that can be dismissed. I was at a briefing yesterday from the City of London Police and they are seriously worried. Extra resources are going in, but we need to have the expertise locally and we haven't got enough on that. That isn't part of the programme, but I do say this. If we start to disagree with the level of council tax, um, a relatively small amount of money, we would have to find the resources elsewhere, but that will mean we cannot progress on some of the other issues that we have. And I know the Chief Constable will explain about the two extra proposals we've got, um, and I think you've had some documents on that. We're always looking at productivity. You've probably heard that uh, Stephen Howes, an ex-assistant commissioner, I think he was in the Metropolitan Police, is doing a review Asked, uh, asked by the Home Secretary to do that. I have at last got a date that he's coming up to see us up here in Suffolk in March. We will have plenty to say on that because we in Suffolk are not in the situation like Northumbria Police, Durham Constabulary, the big metropolitan areas where they literally get money thrown at them in compared to Suffolk. It's unfair and unreasonable. We've spoken about the funding form review. That is progressing and I really do hope by this time next year um, we will be getting somewhere. I am told by the policing minister only uh, on Wednesday it will be coming out for public consultation later this year, and I'm sure you as members of this panel will want to have your views. 
But I can think of all sorts of areas where Suffolk has been leading the way on productivity, yet still, with demand going up, we haven't quite got enough. Smaller things that really, really wind me up are, for example, the outrageous increase in audit fees, going up into six figures. This apparently, well, it wasn't negotiated. They roll over the PSSA, who negotiate on Constabulary's behalf. Most of them just accepted it. They didn't negotiate. They just waved it through. A pretty shocking way for them to behave, in my personal opinion. It's scandalous. It is taking advantage of the taxpayer. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing I can do about it. The same is happening to local authorities and their audit fees. It is an outrage. I don't care what anybody else says. That's my view, and I'm sticking to it. It's just wrong. But we have to find the pound notes to pay for it. I just want to move on with two other things I'd like to say before we go to questions and so on. Um, Sandra will be very happy to give you the details on the survey. And I know Rachel will be happy to talk about the two initiatives we've got there in some detail, because they are important and crucial to the constabulary's future. I've mentioned the HMIC report, and it's really important we take notice of that. We do not want our constabulary, like many others, to be put into special measures. I am very confident with the right leadership and so on, that will not happen in Suffolk, but we have got to address this issue of communication and engagement. And the two proposals you've got there, the digital and engagement uh, desk and the rapid response video scheme, will certainly help move the constabulary forward without any doubt. And please remember, everybody, this is about looking after victims. It is not just some ledger line stuck on the edge there. Domestic abuse, domestic violence, over 10,000 crimes a year, went up nearly 20% during lockdown. Are we really prepared to leave these people on their own and suffer? We have to do more to help. It's underreported and we have to do far better. And that's a collective approach involving councils and others. It is not just a policing issue. So please remember what the HMIC have said. Going back over the last few years, the increase in police officers is very, very significant. Yes, it's in the government's uplift program, 179 officers over three years due to be completed at the end of March. In fact, we're going to do a little bit better than that and we have got some funding for that. But it's a very young and inexperienced workforce. You don't suddenly become a top grade detective just by going on a course. You need years of experience. We need to keep older officers on board in order to train uh, and help those younger, inexperienced recruits. They're not all young, by the way. Uh, but that's really, really important as we move forwards, trying to solve more crime and prevent crime. And we're on the case for that. But overall, with the increases in council tax over the last four years, we're actually going to have 228 extra full-time officers. So we will be comfortably over 1,400 officers, more than Suffolk has ever had. That's what the policing minister, we were singled out. Uh, that's what the policing minister said on Wednesday of one of the forces that has actually got more officers than ever before. Um, we can debate, yes, we haven't got as many PCSOs, so I'm not trying to give all the lily on that, but they are young. And it is important we recognize that. So. With these proposals, of course, the two here um, financed by the council tax, seven extra officers and 17 staff, I really do think it will make a difference. And the very last point I'd like to make is um, the council tax reduction scheme. I hope everybody is aware, and I do support it, I'm not saying it's wrong, but the penalty if every council in Suffolk could cost the constabulary budget over £200,000. I have to find that money from somewhere. So unintended consequences at district and borough level, I absolutely get that. In fact, we debated it here um, last night, as you know, Sarah. But it does have other, other consequences. Where do you find that extra money from? So please remember that there are other things as well. And I know the council tax reduction scheme for those in work, um, obviously there's help for pensioners already, is important. Um, and it probably affects the county council far more than we do. And lastly, from the information I have, I am very, very conscious of those on low incomes. I wish I was not in this position. I really, really do. I do not like putting up taxes at all. But I really do have to balance that with the situation we're in. And I believe I'm right in saying that pensions and many other benefits run by the DWP will be helping people going up by around 10% in April. So there is some compassion there. 
to help those on lower incomes or those who are finding it in difficulty. There are other schemes I know organised by districts and county council and public sector leaders to help with the cost of living crisis. I know it's not enough. I wish we could do more. But my main role here, uh, with great respect to everybody in this room today, is to try and make sure the constabulary is efficient and effective as possible, but also adequately resourced. And just think of those terrible incidents we have witnessed and learned about in the last few days and going back over a few months. If we start to erode the constabulary's capability, I'm not saying it's cause and effect, nor am I saying it's a solely police responsibility, because it most certainly is not. We all have a responsibility there, but it will be putting us in an even more difficult position as we go forward. So I'll leave it at that, Mark, and um, happy to be cross-examined by uh, the Police and Crime Panel. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I will now open the floor to the panel for questions. Panel members uh, are requested to, to direct all their questions to the PCC, and it will be for the PCC to determine who is most appropriate to answer that question. Uh, I think I saw Councillor Finch and then Councillor Bridgman and then Councillor Gardner. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you, Tim, for a very powerful presentation of a summary of what we've got in front of us, and I would agree with you, these are difficult times. Um, Sorry, uh, James, you may need to speak closer to the speaker we can hear. Right. Um, we are facing difficult times, as you say. Before we go on to this budget, I think it might help, as part of the 21-22 precept, the increase provided funding for a police staff income generation officer who will develop bids for funding, build income generation, and develop a stronger portfolio of income strands. Can you please perhaps give a very brief update as to the successes to date that have been achieved following that appointment and of other posts proposed as part of the, the increase? Yeah, no, thank you, James. I will ask Rachel to comment on, on that as well in a minute. But uh, we did have difficulties recruiting, but she has been in post for some months. I think back in October she started. And there has been considerable progress um, regarding Section 106 and community infrastructure levy payments, which I know not every council um, actually has. So as an example, we've got a very good agreement in place um, down at Chilton Fields in Baber, uh, which will help with policing there. I've mentioned before the fact that we got, and this was before she started, the £432,000 for Stowmarket Police and Fire Station, the one new build facility uh, in, in the county. And there's good discussion and agreement already in Brightwell Lakes with the big development near Adderstall Park. And of course, one of the things that has been delivered very, very, I think, successfully is a big 106 agreement um, with the Sizewell Sea when it actually gets going. And lessons were learned, a lot of work done by the constabulary um, from what was done down at uh, Hinkley Point in, in Somerset. So there is a good, very good agreement there, and we're confident that that will cover any extra costs that are incurred on the constabulary for security, transport, and things like that. So those are some examples. Um, she is looking out for any other opportunity there are. Um, those in Ipswich will know uh, we've had some very successful work done with the Safer Streets Fund. Got half a million quid in the last round there to help on a multi-agency basis uh, there. And when other opportunities come up, we'd like to do that. And I've said before, um, James, you know, we really want other uh, community safety partnerships to look at where they've got uh, areas where help could come from these particular government funds. That doesn't mean we can't do more in it, which I'm sure we can. So those are the sorts of things we're looking at. And um, I don't know, Rachel, if you want to comment, but it's a really important post, something I've been asking for for some time, and it definitely is having good, good effects and good rewards. Thank you. Yes, I'll just add to that in terms of future focus. I'm really clear in my mind what it is that policing should be doing. Unfortunately, that has been eroded over the last few years, and, and the PCC has referenced that already. There will be work ahead to look at how we uh, are providing services and perhaps ought to be seeking an income back from other agencies where we are providing policing services that are outside of our scope already trialled uh, that with a couple of pilot uh, opportunities 
uh, around specific cases where we have made a, uh, a, a request in for funding back to the service uh, because we have provided, for example, care to young people who have gone missing who should actually be sitting with the social services and children's young people's services rather than policing, and we've had several thousand pounds back from that. We have to tread carefully. We do have a responsibility. I'm very clear about that as well, and multi-agency is something that um, I have started this role passionately part of and keen to support. But, there, and I'm sure we will touch back on this, it has come to a time where, because the police are available 24 hours, seven days a week, 365, then we are providing services outside of our scope. And that's what I'll be looking to focus the income generation officer around in order to make those claims back into the service. I just have a ballpark and give me an estimate or give the panel an estimate of the sort of funds in value terms that have been bought into the, um, the police constabulary. Well, it, dep it depends on the situation. I'll, I'll, well, I mean, it can range from a few thousand pounds right up to hundreds of thousands of pounds. It doesn't get into the millions, but what I would say is that... Well, I can't go into... <laughs> I can't go into details over sizable, but let me put it this way, it's well over seven figures. But that's only a, but it's, I, I'm not at liberty to go into that. But when it comes to the SIL agreements, that is done by negotiation. So, for example, I think in Brightwell Lakes, um, we'd have to, probably have to come back to you with detail. I don't know if you know the... Well, the aspiration I would like to see is that each year, around a million pounds could be gained. But that all depends on the economic situation and developments and so on. Lovely, thank you. Uh, obviously, there's a number of you, so if you can keep your questions as succinct as possible. Not to say that one wasn't, James, so let me just reach out. So, uh, Councillor Bridgman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, could the PCC explain how the additional resources requested will deliver value for money? Well, value for money, um, and thank you for the question. That's, um, that is a very good one. This is where our accountability and performance panel, which we hold six times a year in public, and I know some of you have been to that. That is where it is, if you like, on behalf of the public, the taxpayer here in Suffolk, I hold the constabulary to account for what they're doing. Uh, we look at performance, we look at the money. Colette here keeps a very eagle eye on how expenditure is going in the constabulary to make sure it's done in the right place for the right reasons. Um, so that we've got um, a fully functioning uh, capability there, which is very, very important, and Cleo's liaison with the constabulary. And by looking at the data, and data management is key in this, and we spend a lot of time looking at data, and there's more to come on that, you can look at how things are being worked. If you look at the raw data, for example, some of the things we've done in previous years for the council tax, if you look at things like the Sentinel team, the serious crime disruption team, you look at the commercial vehicle unit that really, really helps with transport and um, hauliers and other public sector um, vehicles as well on our main road network. It does make a real difference. Um, we've got an extra one in the rural crime team. So what we can do there, having expanded the capacity that rural areas must not be left out. They pay their dues and taxes like everybody else. The Kestrel teams, which are quite pertinent, we have three, uh, as I think you know, and that two of them were paid for through the council tax and they are looking at neighbourhood crime. So there's quite a lot there that is being done, but it does need resourcing. We've spoken about the control room, and the reason these other two areas are important, and Rachel will um, elucidate on that very soon, is because it enables the force to be more efficient, more productive, instant communication, looking at other channels to communicate with people. It isn't, I'm afraid, all about the East Anglian and the written um, newspapers these days. Different generations have different ways of communicating, and we've got to be up to, up to scratch with that. Also, a quick response, like the digit, um, a digital video response, I'm really, really sure it will make a huge difference. So if you put all those things together, and there are many more, um, domestic um, servitude, modern slavery, we put resources into that. Um, the liaison looking at prisoners to clear up conviction rates. There's a whole raft of things that are being done. We look at that all the time in order to make, keep the constabulary on their toes to make sure that money, that hard-earned taxpayers' money, their pound notes, are really put to good effect. 
As I said earlier, there's always room for improvement, but it is a constant learning process. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Rachel. That might help. Thanks. Sorry, uh, if, I, if I may, I just wonder if it would be the ideal time that you alluded to and you just invite the Chief Constable in to speak as to, at this early stage, get a clear understanding of what these two, the two proposals, pro proposals are. Means. Thank you. And I, and I am really excited by these two proposals, and I'll explain why. And I think you've all been sent some additional information, which I can see on your desk, so I'll refer to this as well. Um, first of all, one of these initiatives is absolutely open to everybody across the whole county, indeed outside of the county. It's about increasing the access in the control room so that anyone who wants to talk to Suffolk Constabulary can. And if you see on page two, at the moment, we're not. Um, as the HMIC inspection has found, a third of the people that try to contact Suffolk Constabulary at the moment are abandoning their calls and we fail to answer. And at the moment, that feels shocking to me. So the first of these initiatives is about expanding that access to everybody that needs to contact us so that we are there to listen and we receive that information. And the second one is, and I'll come to these in turn, but the second one by introduction is looking at our key victim area. One third of all crime approximately in Suffolk Constabulary is domestic related. So that is one third of all of our victims we are looking to increase our access and be far more immediate and professional with that contact that we make. But just taking those in turn, the first one, the digital contact and engagement desk, the PCC has already said, the need has come, it perhaps has almost passed actually, that Suffolk Constabulary needs to catch up with our technology. It has been phrased that we are an analog service in a digital era, and I probably can't put it better than that. We have to accept that 88% of the adult population now owns a smartphone, and when you look at 16 to 24-year-olds, and in the context of the recent events in Ipswich, of course, we know that our teenagers are particularly of concern, it's 96% of 16 to 24-year-olds have a smartphone. We have to provide a way of contacting and speaking to them and for them to contact us that they feel familiar with and that, that is their way of communicating. Whether that feels normal to me as a 50-something year old or not, I have to make sure that the organization is able to communicate with them. It is a service, of course, that provides huge opportunities in terms of translation, in terms of um, providing greater access 24-7 as well, because Quite a lot of this is about making sure that we have a full service. At the moment, if you've been onto our website, you'll see that our live chat facility is available Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. Well, those are exactly the hours that if it was me, I wouldn't be able to contact because I'm too busy at work. I need a service that's in the evenings, and other people need a service that's at 2 o'clock on a Saturday evening or, or Sunday morning. So we need to make sure that we've got the facilities and the technology but of course behind that is the staff as well that manages that digital contact and engagement desk. Alongside that, in the last year, we've seen an increase in dash cam footage by 150%. When we look at the number of people who have ring doorbells and video footage on, from their front doorbell, across the country now it's 10 million people and increasing every day. We are just not keeping up at the moment in Suffolk Police and we need to be able to absorb all of that. When someone contacts us through the digital contact and engagement desk, they want to send us their dash cam footage. They want to send us what they've filmed from wearing a helmet when they've been cycling or their front doorbell footage. We can't do that at the moment. They get to speak to a person often after waiting for an hour because they've had to wait so long. You've heard that we've had an increase in demand as well. That is largely, we've noticed that rise exponentially after COVID. A lot of that is connected to the withdrawal of, of other agencies, and I am working hard with that multi-agency approach. I think it's entirely the culture of Suffolk that we work in partnership with our other agencies, and I've got some very strong relationships to do that. But it doesn't get away from the fact that there's been a 43% increase in the concerns for welfare. Now, policing will take 
responsibility if there's an immediate risk to life. A lot of those concerns for welfare are not immediate risks to life, but we are the agency that's at the end of the phone, and we're often the ones that are called first. So that sets the context of the digital contact and engagement uh, desk. It says there in detail quite how many people we're talking about and what the technology is likely to provide. What it essentially comes down to in terms of what does that look like, it's extra staff that can man and operate those, that facility 24-7, all day, seven days a week. And it's also the training and the technology that we need to put into place to facilitate that. So I don't know if you want me to pause on the digital contact and engagement desk first, because I'm quite happy to take specific questions, and then I can move on to the domestic uh, violence and rapid response video later on. Thank you, Chief Constable. That seems a very sensible uh, offer. So in terms of, I know I have a list of people who want questions, but are there specific questions in relation to this area? Councillor Burns. <laughs> Um, Rachel, thank you very much indeed. I think you explained more than the papers did, um, having just been involved with the uh, Haverhill murder and CCTV, I realised that how hard it was to actually upload a load of uh, things, having spent all night literally sitting there repeating myself, so anything that helps there. A um, couple of questions. One is, how will you measure this uh, obviously, the inspectorate can do that as well, but how do you measure the effectiveness of this digital investment? And also, when we went on the tour of the um, control room, I did find it quite cramped. Are we going to allocate more space for these people to, to work there rather than actually in the same area? Thank you. Thank you. Um, two really important questions, two that are very much linked into the broader transformation project that I know you were all briefed on last year because, of course, this will also be a continuation of the investment that was made last year as well. The first point about data analytics is absolutely vital. So with limited resources as we have, we can't just put a broad brush across everything. So for example, I talk about a 24-7 service, but actually do we need the same number of people every moment and every hour of the day? Quite potentially not when there's also a bank of uh, people who are going to traditionally answer the telephone. This is not a replacement service, this is additionality that I'm proposing here. So the data analytics will be an important part of this investment. It will be part of the role of those additional staff that would be brought in. Mm -hmm. And being able to analyze that information, as, as you know, because I'm aware you're, you're well-versed in digital technology, it's so much easier once that system is in place to have that information. What we need is the anal analytics behind that through an analyst to say these are the pink t peak times this is when this type of victim contacts us and the response that we want to have. So we can then model, and I would look to model the resource appropriately according to when the demand comes through. So that's the answer to the first question. Um, the second question, just remind me, please, sorry. Sorry, about the working area in the control room. Yes, the space. So uh, again, it's a full transformation program. Um, digital often brings an opportunity to create space if you just think about bookshelves and how we've been able to reduce that down to a Kindle, it, it brings the opportunity to create space. We can clear out quite some old-fashioned space because we don't need it any longer. The technology has presented that. I do want to invest, if the funds are available to do so, in the working environment of the team. But first and foremost, we need to make sure that the service is correct and efficient. And I believe it is, yes, about creating physical space, but as much as anything, it's also about creating space in an operator's time so that they can present the best service possible back to victims and members of the public. Thank you. Just before I move to Councillor Beard, just on your, your point there, uh, Rachel, in terms of the transformation programme, the time scale. Well, transformation takes a long time, and, and I think it's ongoing. So this time last year, when we were talking about some of the investment in numbers of controllers, I wasn't even able to project this proposal that I'm coming to you today with and through, through the Police and Crime Commissioner who's coming today. 
So where do we go next? I think it's an ongoing transformation. I absolutely see the technology that other forces are using. I see the successes and the victim satisfaction that they are getting back from that. I believe we can take that further, but whether that's going to take a year or beyond, I don't know. But at the moment, I'm sitting here alongside the PCC, and the proposal is for the year ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning. Um, yes, I, I want to just ask the question on the IT, uh, particularly the phones and younger people, because uh, as we all know, they live on the damn pins nowadays, don't they? And so that is an important area, and it's one I hadn't perhaps thought about as much until I've heard you speaking about it this morning. But how, how many of this new staff, I think there were 17, would be employed to help uh, improve that area? And would that include some sort of um, very experienced iTech people higher up the pay ladder? Because, um, you know, we have lots of top people getting a lot of money, and um, perhaps we don't need to pay those very high prices. Just wanted to comment on that. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Peter. I'll obviously bring Rachel into that. Um, it's actually 14 staff for this part, the other staff are for the other program, I think. 14 staff. But the point about this is I think we all know how difficult it is to recruit people in IT at the moment. Um, and we've got to make sure in these pressurised situations we've got people who are capable and resilient and have experience. And I think if we look at that, I understand where you're coming from, but we do need to make sure they are properly rewarded and compensated for what they're doing, otherwise they will just go somewhere else. And that's a really important point to remember, because if we do not do this extra work and looking after victims and making response better, I think we've got a problem. So I'll go ask Rachel to comment on that. And another thing I forgot to mention related to extra demand and so on, the huge Crown Court backlog, which has gone up 70%, we have had to employ extra people to look after victims and witnesses and to be fair defendants. So please bear that in mind in your deliberations. But um, Rachel, we, we talked often about making sure that we get people at the right pay grades and so on, and it is properly analysed, so perhaps you'd like to comment on that. Yes, thank you. And, and for reassurance, those that are the, tech, the technologically minded and professional individuals that would be involved in this project, we already have a ICT department that I would be drawing on with no addition. This would be a prioritisation within their programme of work. So there wouldn't be any additional staff being brought in at that level. The proposal here for the 2 and 12, which the PCC has just referred to, are the, the operators who would be at the receiving end. So they would be the customer interface, the people receiving the digital information online, and they would be the responders, and, the, and two of those being the supervisors. Everything else is within our structure already to deliver. And of course, we are talking about a package of work that has already been um, exercised and, and used in a context elsewhere in other forces. So the, the technology is already in existence. This isn't about creating new technology, it's about implementing it in Suffolk. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mansell. Uh, uh, thank you. Actually, you've just an answered one of the questions I had about the technology. Clearly, you've already said that you think Suffolk is a bit behind the times. So I was going to say, you know, presumably this, um, this technology has already been used by other forces and it is working well there, but you've just um, said that. What I, what I did want to ask, though, is that um, clearly if, if you're going to make it easier for people to upload their... Uh, videos from their doorbells and their dash cams, you, you are going to receive a whole load more information and data and things to analyse. And I just wanted to know whether that resourcing of the 14 extra staff was, was, all, was including the officer, the, the staff time that is going to be taken up in looking at all of these extra videos and deciding whether they are important or not and, and making sure you get the right information from them so does that 14 include people to analyze the in, more and more information that you're going to get from the system or is it just purely they're going to be handling the things coming in yeah, no, well i'll ask rachel to give detail but of course please remember as rachel was saying this is a transformation 
programme on top of what we're already doing this year, which is virtually complete, by the way, um, just in case anybody wants to know, that 1.4 million quid that has gone in for the CCR uh, this year. Uh, but yes, um, there is time put aside, but of course, if demand then explodes and you have to filter them out, I'm sure we'll have to look at it again. But um, So it's, a, it's not absolutely set in stone. This is the start of a journey. As you heard the Chief Consul saying, this doesn't happen overnight, so we need to be ready. But as engagement methods and um, social media and all these other things come into it, we have to look at how we can respond accordingly. But Rachel, anything else to add on that? Yeah, just a couple of things. And, I, and again, another good question. It re relates back to the question about data analytics. This is the absolutely essential part of understanding what comes in through a new system and then being able to prioritize and, and accordingly fit the resources available to the information that's coming in. But of course, actually, it can reduce crime as well. So if we're delivering a good service and it becomes known that we are delivering a good service and we're responding to dash cam footage or, or uh, doorbell footage, whatever it may be, CCTV, then we will be more effective that way. So yes, and I can't answer it fully at the moment because I don't know what the data analytics are going to provide, once the information can be assessed, then the resourcing can be looked at. But I am absolutely convinced that in terms of public satisfaction and confidence, we're going to be increasing and doing far better than currently. Thank you. I think that's uh, the last question on just that subject. <laughs> We've got a while to go still. I was just going to ask, actually, um, will two supervisors and 12 be enough? Because if you're saying that's going to be a 24-7 service is that going to be integrated into what you already have but 14 people effectively for delivering 24 7 doesn't seem a lot so are they being integrated into existing uh, it, yeah I'll, I'll if i can come straight in um data analytics it will be a start i don't know i uh, i do believe that it will lead to us reconfiguring something that the current people are doing. So if you understand that they are the ones who are currently trying to deal with this data information coming in, but coming in in different formats from different places, that will become more efficient as I foresee it. Some of those may well then be able to move across into this. We wouldn't operate a digital contact and engagement facility separate from the CCR overall. It will be part of an integrated process and it would be a case of looking at the resource available across the whole team. I think if I could just say, Mark, just to reassure people, yeah, we don't know, clearly, and that will be down to the uh, constabulary to look at this, but it is a significant start. I mean, it would be no good just putting two or three people in, for example. If you're going to do a 24-7 approach, you do need to have enough capacity, and um, having had some pretty vigorous discussions about this, as you can imagine, I personally think this will be a very good starting point, and obviously, well, we'll keep it under review, simple as that. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely satisfied with that, having worked, managed the control room, I know the demand and, and that 12 people don't go very far in the, when you're looking at 24-7, so I don't, I don't personally have an issue with the numbers you're after, it's whether that can meet that uh, demand. We, if we're now happy, we'll move on to the rapid digital video response. Okay, well I'll hand straight over to Rachel on that. So if I can take you to the, uh, the last page of your additional sheet, the rapid video response. This has been initially trialled in Kent Police and is being adopted by a number of other forces around the country. Um, the ethos and philosophy behind this is the sooner that we can provide some support to somebody in a domestic violence situation, the better, but it is also about providing them with the control of the context, the safe space in order to contact the police. It's been a problem for a very long time that any phone interaction with us can be actually a risky situation for the, for the victim. They, very often they need to call us and call us quickly and they want to and need to, but they're not away from their abuser. This is the opportunity for us to have face-to-face -face contact with a victim who wants to uh, call the police and make contact with us. If I can liken it to, if, if anybody here has used Skype, I'm sure we've all used Teams or something similar to that, FaceTime on a smartphone, being able to dial in, have a, a safe link provided back to the individual, and then they have a face-to-face -face conversation with a, a real police 
employee to provide support advice within minutes of an incident if it is at their choosing. So uh, it does provide that opportunity to deal with the volume that I've already referred to. Um, since the last review of our local policing model in Suffolk Police, which was carried out in 2018, domestic incidents have increased by 71%. We're talking about a huge increase for domestic abuse across the county. I wouldn't initially or immediately say within that means we've got so many more victims. Sadly, I suspect back in 2018, we just didn't hear from a lot of them. We are now being more accessible, and this is the next stage, the transformation to hearing what's actually happening to people in homes. It does deal with the complexity of domestic abuse. We have the opportunity at their agreement to be able to record the conversation and the interaction, so not only are we listening to the words, which we would over a traditional telephone conversation, we can see injuries, we can see damage because it's all on the video screen. We can see children in the background who have maybe been affected by the adverse childhood experience that they've just gone through. It's convenient, it's fast, it requires a careful training of officers, which is included in the costs here, and it also, most importantly, leads to more successful prosecutions. Thank you, uh, Chief Constable. Uh, Councillor John Byrne, do you have a question on this subject? Lovely, thank you. Thanks, Rachel, again. I think anything that gives a, a, a quick response to any uh, victim of crime, whether it's domestic abuse or anything, is very good. But as you said, the figures show that you know, there's a massive demand. Sorry, jo John, sorry. It, m it may be I'm going deaf as I've hit the 60, but I'm, I don't know if people at this end are struggling to hear. I, I think perhaps we all need to speak closer to the... I think there's a problem with the system today. I, it's very low. That is very I low. I found it very low. Yeah. For a long time, yeah. yeah. Is it? It's been at least a month, I think. It's been terrible. Okay, yeah. just so... Okay, people I'll try and get a bit there. closer then. Although it is a microphone, so it's modulated. So. Anyway, um, what I was saying was uh, anything that's uh, a quick response is, is very important. Um, and I can understand the digital option. Uh, it, I would very much hate that it effectively becomes the only method that people talk to domestic abuse victims. Um, and obviously you said the domestic abuse levels have gone up. Uh, I think we've all probably heard and seen about it exacerbated by COVID, of course, people sitting at home uh, with their so-called loved ones. Um, one thing that does worry me a little bit uh, is going, uh, maybe emphasising perhaps too much on the digital side, is the body language side of things. Is You said, yes, you might be able to see injuries, you might be able to see kids in the background, but there's nothing when you speak to somebody who's experienced some sort of abuse, whether it's domestic, sexual, or whatever it might be, is what their body language is. And um, that's what really would worry me slightly about this, is that the officers, however well trained they are, say, it's easy for me to just get on the phone or, 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 a, or a iPad or whatever, and not actually understand what the victim is going through. Thank you. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but I think Rachel said earlier, please remember this is an additional resource. It's not an instead of. And that's really, really important to emphasise that. And if you could just um, consider, John, what everybody consider, if you think of the huge amount of commissioning we do with the IDVA service, which is now bigger than ever, my personal view is this will absolutely complement all the other organisations we help dealing with domestic abuse uh, right across the county. Um, it's not just here in Ipswich, but you think of all the organisations um, that have been supported by um, our commissioning over the years, there has been a step change and confidence, I think, for people to report domestic abuse. It's definitely underreported, and that's probably one of the reasons why there's much more there. And we have to build on that because it's a, it's a, a shocking crime, terrible. And if anybody's experienced it or seen it or witnessed it, um, you can understand how devastating it can be and the effect it has not just on children but on business, on productivity and all these sorts of things. And the other things that are going on, you know, the uh, Domestic Abuse Champions Network. I think we've got hundreds of them now in Suffolk through all organisations. That is really, really important to help those who are suffering, sometimes for many years, to build on that. And now that, as Rachel was saying, with the 
advent of mobile phones it's been for many years, and nearly everybody has one. Anything we can do there to help uh, actually bring people to justice, but particularly to look after the victims, and especially if children are indirectly involved, has to be a good thing. So I would implore everybody to support this, because if you don't, then we're not going to be able to move forwards. And that's not a threat, I don't mean it like that. But please consider this extra demand, and for that small amount of extra money, and I know things are difficult, we could start to make an even bigger difference. But um, Rachel, anything you'd like to add, add to that? Yes, so if I can just pick up on a couple of bits there, hopefully you can hear me. Um, the first one about the uh, replacement, I think the Police and Crime Commissioner has answered. Safe to say that, for your information, we carried out a short piece of research on live chat, the pilot live chat that was in the control room, and um, particularly around domestic abuse victims. And the feedback was actually quite surprising because what we had hypothesized was that they would want to talk to an individual and that they wouldn't use live chat. It was the complete reverse. They wanted to text. They found it effectively text, but message. They found it easier to send a message to let us know than it was to actually verbalize what had happened to them. And that was really quite powerful for me that, um, that you know, again, in a di different, we're moving in a different digital space nowadays. But actually, making contact, it doesn't even need to be words when you can see somebody's face. We could all sit in front of a domestic violence victim and know that something had happened without them uttering a single word. And that's the body language piece that will be picked up by the trained police officers. They will know what's happened because they can see it. Whereas if somebody's silent on the end of a telephone, it's very frustrating because you think you know what's happened, but there's, you, don't, you can't do anything until they actually say anything, and this is making that far more accessible. I've got two people just on that, and I'll ask uh, the question, and then I'll hand over to Francine. Will this evidence, can it be used in evidence? This, this what you captured, can it be used in evidence? Or do you have to almost have the, the consent of the offender for it to be used in court? Yet it will, so our uh, communications through the CCR are recorded, and this would be, re would be recordable. I, I would have to actually look into the technology and find out things like the human rights around it, how we would capture it, but um, it could certainly potentially be, uh, and I would imagine very usefully be recordable and used in evidence. Thank you. Uh, Francine. Right. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about this new service and we can see what goes on on the back end but for a victim what does that look like and it relates to my question that I asked you Tim a few meetings ago around training um, for officers about recognizing um, the difference for black women when they are victims of domestic abuse how they may not present the same as a white woman. So the technology, when you talk about it will see injuries and things like that on a black woman, that's not necessarily the case. And to be transparent, talking from a lived experience and contact with the police, it doesn't, how are you, how are you gonna raise the trust and confidence in people like me that the service is going to be of benefit to them when the organization may not understand for people from my community and other um, black and you know brown people that when we come into contact with the police because we don't present as a typical victim as in bruises that show um, how confident are you that the new technology and the training of the officers will be useful for victims of domestic violence who look like me. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very good point, Francine, and I absolutely understand what you're saying. So training is down the responsibility of the uh, chief constable, so that will certainly be noted, and I'm sure that will be part of the programme. Just to reassure you, that's one of the reasons we've worked for some years now with, with Phoebe, the organisation that does help victims of domestic abuse and sexual um, offences for black and minority ethnic groups. 
and we're very pleased to work with them because I think that helps our understanding which we can also pass on to the constabulary. And as I've said so many times, this is about everybody in Suffolk. We do have to nuance it and make sure we understand and have that relationship, that engagement with all communities. And I know we've spoken about that many times. That's something I am personally absolutely 110% committed to. And when you hear from various um, organ, oh, it's difficult to engage. Well, no, it isn't difficult to engage. You just have to go out and see them and understand them and build up the relationship. So, yes, there is more to do on that. I, I agree, but that is something we are absolutely committed to, all of us up here every single one of us to develop that. For the specific ideas of training and so on concepts there, that is important. So yeah, I'm sure we need to do more, but Rachel, I know you're very keen on uh, making sure we're right up to the top of the tree there with the training, understanding the different cultures uh, and so on. That is absolutely crucial. You have to have that sensitivity and understanding in order to take it forward. And that will, of course, require more training when it for, for the frontline operators, I suspect. Before you answer, Rachel, can I just say that um, a freedom of information request was put in um, with regards to how many black women feel that the police, the treatment from the police, they weren't treated fairly or, or um, believed or listened to. And of the cases that were ongoing, none of them had had um, an outcome and none of them felt that the confidence that they would reach a satisfactory conclusion and this is just in Suffolk. And our population, our demographics for black and brown people in Suffolk has gone down a lot when you look at the census. And I'm just concerned that I have women like me coming to me because they don't know what to do. They don't feel confident that the service is gonna meet their need. And I just wanna be reassured that your officers understand from our perspective, what we need to feel safe. Just one comment on this. I absolutely understand your point of view. I think that's a topic, I'm not saying we don't answer it, but that's more for the accountability. We can certainly take that way, accountability panel, where we can hold the constabulary to account. And I think that's a good point, and I'll certainly take that away. But I'm not sure this is quite the right form for that. But let me give a brief comment on that, if you don't mind. I don't want to sound dismissive, because I'm not. It is important. Thank you. Thanks, Francine. Um, and I, just on the back of the last comment, I, I do think that there's more work to do. I, we've talked about it before. This There is much, much more work to do um, in training, in engagement, in um, just understanding a different part of the community from policing and interaction. So that that is... Um, additional to this work that we're talking about here, just in the context of the rapid video mm, response, so mm. bringing it back into the context of um, women of colour who are domestic abuse victims, by being able to see someone on screen is additional information to the officers as well as for the victim to see an officer. Now, I would like to think that that is a more, and I would assume that that is going to be more often than not, a more positive response than being able to hear somebody on the end of the phone. So a woman of colour phoning up as a domestic abuse victim doesn't identify as such, they identify as, as a, a domestic mm. abuse victim. And as you have said, quite often they need a different response and they should and they deserve a different response and there's different context, but that's not possible to see because it's not mentioned and it's not visible whereas face to face immediately the officer taking the call knows that it's a woman of color who's been assaulted and can adapt given that additional training that we've just touched on adapt their response accordingly because of the needs of the woman that they can see in front of them as opposed to a voice on the phone that's not identifiable as any particular ethnicity and sadly the subconscious assumption is very often as you know that the person is white yeah, and they receive yeah. that response so they're not going to get as an effective service as they could have if they had this video face-to-face -face access and with regard what i wanted to know with regards to this technology we know what's going to go on on the back end but how will a victim know that this is going to happen so I'm thinking about women who cover their face cover their hair they phone up they're a victim all of a sudden they can be seen 
how is that going to that's going to add further stress for them if they now have to be visible if they don't want to the telephone is there or the live chat is there the digital engagement desk is there this is additional this isn't instead of they don't have this this requires the victim to accept the video link so the officer that cannot video somebody in that doesn't want to be they send a code oh, and the right. code is then accepted so only the victim has the opportunity to open up that visual right. link that, that's what i wanted to yeah. know how, how are they going to know what to expect and they don't have to use it it's right. additional okay thank I, you. just make a suggestion here uh, mark i mean this is i think these are very important points but if you want to as a panel submit a question for example for us to have at a future app or something like that that would be a very good form to look at it in depth um, because i think these are really important issues and we can uh, i can ask them to the confidence board that's in the constabulary to look at this and come up with some ideas so we can look at that certainly <laughs> but i don't think we can really um no that's so if you're happy to do that, yep, yep. that would be something where we can certainly help. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the uh, questions there. Inga. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wonder if you're aware of how many women that live in domestic abuse situations get into it actually do have the smartphone and have the full control of it. Because I could imagine that if you have a very abusive partner, um, they may even control your phone and you then um, they may leave go to work or whatever you use your phone that abuse you come home and can check your phone through and say oh you have been in contact with the police how how is that going to work because are they not going to put women off or will the abuser totally then take the phone away from them in, in case they think that they are easy access to the police? Well, that's always a, a risk, Inga, but this is why you have to have a variety of methods for doing this. It's so important, and I can absolutely assure you, ever since I've been here, dealing with domestic abuse, violence, coercive control, and so on, has been right at the top of our agenda. There has been, a, a, I would argue, a real transformation from where we were 10 years ago. I think we didn't even have one, for, one ever independent domestic violence advisor. We're now getting up, heading up towards 20. That's just one example. Um, so we have to have a variety of methods, I think, for people to con um, contact the force. I mean, there's the 55 number, for example, uh, and I get it. Yes, you get some of these uh, controlling um, men. Um, they will confiscate phones. Yes, it's a problem, but that's why we have to have all these different different methodologies for getting in touch with the police. And we all have a responsibility as well. If we have see someone we think is in difficulty, can we talk to them, children, schools? The whole society needs to do far better on this. What we can do is provide more opportunities, more evidence, working with the voluntary sector that does a fantastic job in this. But my goodness me, as you've heard from Rachel, there is so much more to do. We are making progress, but my goodness me, there's a long, long way to go. So this is really, really important, this video link. And if we don't do that, because we don't have the money, then I hope everybody will remember what is going to happen to the victims. What would you do instead? And it's a small amount to ask people, despite the difficulties, and believe you me, I have found it really, really difficult this year in order to ask for this. But we have to balance what is needed for society in a tolerant, compassionate society looking after victims, bringing people to justice. This is not a panacea, it is a help, and a very strong help methodology to do it. But I do agree with you, it's one of many solutions. Thank you, I'm uh, gonna move to the more general debate. I, I think I would just pick up um, on one of your comments, uh, Tim, regarding you know, that we should consider, if we don't fund this, what the outcomes may be. Obviously, we are here a panel to just consider the funding of of the precept and I'd, I'd think it would be unfair to level any suggestion that if we don't uh, agree this precept that we are making victims more vulnerable no that's not what i'm sure I'm, you didn't mean that that's but not what i'm saying no i, I think i'm just asking across, you to consider yeah, it yeah which is I not quite the same as, I, I did heard, say earlier this is not a threat actually uh, well, right. i did hear some comment i think people down here made comment as well i think it was i know what you meant but i, yeah. I think we need to keep that in context uh, so I'm actually going to go straight to Peter Gardner for the more generic questions on, on the budget. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Passmore, the panel has supported your precept increases in the past because it's recognised that the PCC was trying to do, for example, like last year's increase in control room staff. However, for this year, I cannot see how the two projects to be funded from the 6% proposed increase would be the first two priorities for the people in the community. And on that basis, if I could refer to the survey information, obviously what we have before us is just simply a financial response where my understanding is, having filled it in, there wasn't an option between 4% and 6%. It was 6%. But what would be of more interest, and I know we haven't got that yet, is actual comments that people have made, because that would then determine what the community think in terms of what their pri real priorities are, which would be perhaps more genuine than having, despite listened to the additional information that's been provided, I would perhaps find it quite hard to sell that to my constituents. So I'll ask Sandra to comment on the survey. There are lots and lots of comments, as you can imagine. I think we've had a bigger response to the survey than we've ever had. Um, and it wasn't uh, at the same levels of support that we've had before, but none nonetheless, there was a significant number in favour as opposed to those who opposed it. I think when you look at all these things in the round, yes, there are the two things, um, projects that we've just, just, just discussed, but it is about maintaining that capability overall. And it's very difficult to put that down into specifics. But in order to maintain what we've done over the last few years, and I mentioned some examples at the beginning, there's been some very, very good results. For example, reducing the threat from county lines, arrests on drugs, dealing with organized crime groups, high harm individuals. I don't need to go through all that list again, Peter. It's very, very important that people do understand that. You heard that we're doing a um, county policing review at the moment. It hasn't been done for the last few years. And I hope that will do quite a lot. And that's one of the things that came up to improve visibility. Now, there's all sorts of methods of visibility. Yes, there's a uniform presence, the visibility, if you like, online, cyber, everything else. That's really, really important we do that to improve that public confidence. We've got the Trust and Confidence Board. Now, that has worked. That will come up with some ideas of what we can do to engage with everybody in Suffolk, far better, all communities, so we get that confidence in the, in the public, which has taken a dent, not because of what's happened in Suffolk, but largely because of what's happened elsewhere, which is distressing for all of us, but we have to recognise that what happens elsewhere does stain the reputation of constabularies everywhere, unfortunately. And... Um, the inspection report was very good, but we need to maintain it. Now, that's quite difficult to put across in a survey, but that's really what this is about, maintaining it and improving on what we've done. And the investment of the last few years, which has been significant, I've mentioned the extra officers that we've got, that really is making a, a very strong difference, and we do need to maintain that. Everybody wants more. I know it's never enough. And with all the savings we're making, I would just implore people to understand when it looks at the money, what other organisations have actually had to have increased demand for less, looking at inflation and everything else, and it's absolutely crucial we do that. Never mind the demand from other parts of the uh, public sector, as we've already said. So I get it, absolutely difficult, and that's why I said this is the most difficult decision I've ever had to, had to agree with. So we can only publicise it, we can all help each other on that, um, and that's where we are. But you know, visibility, whether it's affordable for some people, I absolutely, I can tell you understand that. I hope I covered that a bit earlier. But I'll just hand over to Sandra, who perhaps could take you through the survey and some of the headlines in it. So, Sandra, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, I did, um, as, you, as you will appreciate, the timescales for these surveys are very tight. Um, by the time we get the settlement, we, set the, we start the survey on January the 6th, and in order to give people a reasonable time to, to um, appreciate that it's happening and take part, we give them three weeks, which meant it closed yesterday at 9 o'clock in the morning. I did very quickly yesterday pull together a document, which I will put on the website once you've had a chance to look at it, which breaks down the, the yeses and the noes, because actually that's... That's the only real question we ask. We ask a few general questions about where people live and what band they pay um, council tax. But the 
the one important question is, do they support Tim's proposal? We give it as the proposal. We don't ask what they would like to, um, where they would like to direct investment. We ask them specifically, do you agree with Tim's proposal? And on that, for this year, we had over 2,000, in fact, 2,116 responses, and 56% agreed with Tim's proposal. So that is really the specific question. We do get lots of um, comments, which we invite people to, to leave for us. And this year, we've had over 1,300, and they're reasonably evenly split between the yeses and the noes. It's free text it's almost impossible to analyse free text. It, was, it would be like having a thousand people in a room and all talking at the same time and trying to, to work out what the themes are. So it's not, it isn't, it isn't designed for, for analysis. It's designed really to give Tim a feeling of what people are saying. And I did print them all out and it ran into a, almost 100 pages over two columns. And Tim has read them because I think he, he knows himself. He wouldn't come here today unless he'd got a flavour of that. Um, we can, um, if, if Mark chooses, the chair chooses, we could give you um, access to those yes, yeses and noes so you can see yourself what people are saying. But the, the question, just to be clear, the question we asked was, do you support Tim? And this reflects that question. If you are interested, I mean, I can give you a bit of a flavour of what people have said, and many people have said they really just can't afford it this year because they're contemplating the other expenses that they will have. But on the other side of the coin, we had people who said, I can't really afford this, but I appreciate how important policing is. So that will give you, very simply, a sort of a feel of what people are saying. Other people are talking very specifically about where they live and the policing in that area. And that's really interesting. And I think the feedback that we get is, is really valuable feedback. But it doesn't answer the question uh, that, that we asked specifically, which was, do you support Tim's proposal? I hope that helps. If I could come back briefly. I suppose the, the only other way then is, is through the roadshow process and the, and the going out and meeting the people. Because otherwise, how are you actually going to find out what people really feel about are their priorities or what they see as their priorities for the county's constabulary. Abs absolutely, and actually that's a really good point because our engagement isn't just about the survey that we have in January. Um, many of you, I know, I've seen you, you were at our public meetings that we ran through um, September and October when Rachel and Tim spoke about the priorities for policing and listened to what people in the local communities were saying. Tim has been out at roadshows across the county. He meets with business um, organisations. Rachel and Tim recently spoke to the Chamber of Commerce. We, we, we um, engage with the NFU, the CLA. The, the main stakeholders across the county, we do try to, um, to engage with as many of them as we possibly can. And that, that, again, is really valuable feedback. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I have five more people who wish to ask questions. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so uh, we'll do the five, and then I think we'll look to see if we can wrap this up with some form of a uh, vote. But uh, I think, Councillor Brisbane, you want to come in with a follow-up on to... Uh... As we're talking about visibility, uh, I've looked at this question with other councillors directly in Ipswich. Um, given the recent murders in the centre of Ipswich, people, especially older, are unlikely to support any increase in the precepts unless there is an increase in police presence in the town. Does the PCC believe that a continuous presence between mid-afternoon and early evening is needed in the centre of Ipswich because of the problems with drug gangs and address aggressive street drinkers what are the PCC's thoughts for the future of policing in Ipswich as I say we've heard the digital side which is good um, a lot of older people are more worried about the traditional side um, thank you very much that's, much that's a very good question and of course public trust and confidence is fundamental to the way we police in this country and have done for well ever since Sir Robert Peel 
well, he still is the father of modern policing, even if it was uh, 100 and, well, getting on for 200 years ago. So those principles still pervade today, and getting the balance right of visibility, the uniform presence, with the change in pattern of crime, which I think we've discussed many times this panel, the hidden harm, domestic abuse, online crime, fraud, you don't deal with that by necessarily having a, somebody in a uniform. On the other hand, looking at our town centres, and certainly the terrible event in Ipswich um, last week, getting that balance right between visibility and reassuring everybody is important. There is more to it, though, than, I, than that, I would say. At the recent stakeholder meeting, if we just talk about Ipswich, but use that as an exemplar for other larger settlements of which we do have, you know, be it Haverhill, Bury, um, Lower Stoft, Felixstowe, everywhere is expanding and the town centres are precious resources. So this is where a multi-agency approach has to work. I mentioned the Safer Streets Fund earlier, we've done that twice in Ipswich. Now that's an excellent example of where agencies join together. I wish other towns would look at doing that. I have asked them, but answer came there none. So the opportunity I hope will be there again. And so if you look at the street scene, the police have a really, really important part in this, but they're not the only ones. So better lighting, safe uh, routes going, if you take Ipswich, for example, linking up the university, I've suggested some time ago, can we have designated safe routes and halls of residence into the town centre that are better lit, better patrol, working with Ipswich Central? You know what we do jointly with the borough and it's at Central, the taxi marshalling scheme for the nighttime economy. But we need to do more things like that and spread it out across the town. And I think there are opportunities in other places. I went out, for example, for the nighttime team in the middle of the summer when it was about 40 degrees in Bury. The principles there are the same, making sure the bar staff, the taxis, the street scene is better. And it spreads out to other areas as well. So police presence, yes. What can we do with local authorities? What we can do with 106 agreements, community infrastructure levies? Because they're not just for policing, as I think everybody knows. What are the other pieces of infrastructure you can put in there? Again, the police gathering intelligence, AMPR, CCTV, can we do more on that? Well, I think the answer is yes, we can. And having the capacity, of course, having the cameras is fine. Like we were saying about the digital uh, contact, having enough people to look at the evidence to analyse it and be aware of it. And again, that's something we need, we need to look at. So I think the lessons learned are many from things like this. And there's no point in just having a throwaway comment. Everybody says lessons learned. Well, actually, what are you going to do about it? It's the actions that count. And I think we will be coming up with some ideas, longer term um, proposals. Um, well, Rachel Sandra and myself were at this meeting with Ipswich Central and other stakeholders last week. It's how we build up for the future. So there are many things. Policing, of course, is fundamental to it. They have the powers of detention, detection, but working with businesses, everybody, we have to do a lot better. And um, whilst we can say that one incident was a, an extreme example and really, really unusual, older people do feel concerned and somehow we have to reassure them with practical measures that the place is not a dangerous um, no-go area. We must never have that. Um, so enhanced policing, work with others, I think will help. And I think Ipswich has got a great future, but we need a proper marketing campaign. All the good things about Ipswich, I've said before, the parks that we've got, some of the historic buildings, linking up the waterfront. Sure, we don't make nearly enough of it, but we can all help each other on that. And we can look at other towns as well. You know, they, they are important. And particularly working with those areas that have got the business improvement districts, they do make a big difference. I'd like to see, for example, more, because they're on the ground, they appreciate it, and getting that feedback from them actually will help move things forward. So there's a lot to do, but believe you me, extra resources have gone into Ipswich compared with other places, but I'm afraid um, I have to look at the whole of Suffolk. We all do. Um, so there's quite a lot to do, without doubt, but we, we are on the case. Thank you. It's very interesting, uh, Rob, because my mum is 90, nearly 91. She gets cross when I say she's 91 because she's not. But actually, it was really interesting that she's lived in Ipswich all her life and she won't go into the town centre now because of that perception, even though I say, mum, you'll be absolutely fine. So it, it, it's a very good point, uh, Rob, yeah. to, to raise that because it does. Do you want to come and quickly come back? I do need to. Oh, yeah. And I would say the one area that I've genuinely think you need to improve on is comms. 
Um, you know, maybe it's too quick for how this has come about, but I went to the partners meeting yesterday. Won't reveal, it's not my place, but there was some really good news there. Um, I was hoping it would have come out today, but you know, that's where you need to improve. We've got a new police station. No one really knows about it. Look at the Suffolk Fire and Rescue and the social media they put out regards their Princess Street fire station. I mean, we've got a blimmin' great logo on the side of the building, but most of the people will say we haven't got a police station, it was shut. So we just need to improve a bit on the communications. Um, I've, I've been very, very keen on communication. I think everybody knows, and Sandra definitely knows that, and either can Sabri know that. So the other game doesn't need the word marketing. Marketing includes communication. There's all sorts of other bits and pieces in that. But I've been saying that for some years. Now, maybe, sadly, an incident like this does actually bring people together and act as a catalyst to do better. Um, it's not a competition, but believe you me, um, we can certainly help with that um, because there are other things we've got to do. And if we work together far more successfully, I think we, we can do a lot better. But I'm absolutely clear Communication, they say money is at the root of all evil. Well, I'll put it this way, I don't know whether this is true or not. Poor communication's got a lot to answer for. And you can always do better, hence we're talking about all the different channels of communication. We have to proliferate it, in my view. Um, but certainly, you can bet your bottom dollar, I'm very keen to do what I can personally, and as I'm sure everybody else is, to improve that. Thanks, Tim. I've got... Um so I've still got five because uh, Inga wanted a question. So if you can make them as uh, succinct and the answers now, please. I've got Peter, did you still want to ask a question? Yeah, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll roll them all into one if I can, so just bear with me. And unfortunately, I forgot my glasses. So I've got to go from memory and try and remember where some of this was. Uh, I just want to start off by saying that I understand the difficult job you have, Commissioner. Uh, I do. And also have great respect for yourself, your chief officers, and the front line policemen and police women. I think they all do an excellent job. But I'll come to the survey. It's really 50, 50%. 50 percent. 56 um, said yes and 44 said no, basically. I call that 50 percent. Um, I couldn't fill in the form on the uh, online. I tried and tried and tried, and, uh, and no prizes for what I would have been saying. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, but uh, there are many like that. Um, you commented Chamber of Commerce and other organisations that you've spoken to and what have you. Well, yesterday, uh, in Great Cornard, we have a food bank, which I helped set up, and I helped um, volunteer there on a Thursday morning and I was talking to lots of people those people there are struggling a man of about 55 I suppose said to me he'd been out of work for two years he said I'm really struggling but this is a godsend he said I pay two pound and I can get over 20 25 pounds worth of food um, albeit date wise and what have you but very, very grateful, and turned around and said, well, I can't repeat the words, but uh, was appalled to think that 15 pounds was wanted by the police uh, to continue. And I did point out that, as you know, Tim, you had 15 um, pounds additional two years ago, and at that time you said there'd be a lower moat going forward. Last year, it went up £10. This year, you're proposing £15, which makes £40 over these three years. And I think I read somewhere that uh, going forward, you will keep it down to 2%. Um, well, you did say that two years ago, and you, you couldn't because of other factors, I understand. Um, so my big concern is that the amount of people that you survey is, is a poor response. Through no fault of yours, it happens at all levels, the district councils, the county councils, we try and engage with people, and they're saying to us, well, we're not... What's the point? You don't take any notice, you're going to stick the, the council tax up, you're going to make us pay more, 
and, 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 th and they really do feel strongly about it at the moment, across the whole board, not just your, your part. Peter, can I just ask you, Sarah, what's the question? Yes, yes. it's all coming. That's why I'm trying to condense it, because I've got about six. <laughs> um, uh, so, the a, band A to band D, you had 1,263 people the great amount of people that responded uh, there. And they're in the worst categories, I think. They really are. And we have to understand that. Us as elected members have to realise that all these are being imposed upon people. Could I just ask that uh, we had a pay rise for the police in 2022, I'm sure I read that in here, of 5%. Is that national? And is that paid for out of your budget, which I think it is, isn't it? Yep, that's fine. So my answer then is that instead of increasing the council tax, whilst I accept the frontline police do need more money, and this is no disrespect to any uh, senior officers at any levels, I think they should take a pay freeze because the amount of money they get is a lot. That uh, a 5% increase or 10% increase to them um, makes a big difference on their wages because they're already at the top. And I understand that. And I know, as you said, we have to pay these people. And the chief constable said that she needs to pay the right people to do this digital. I understand that. But there has to be a limit. And really, uh, if Peter, we... Can you, I did ask for succinctness, so can you please get to the... I yeah. know you had a number of questions, uh, but... Yeah, well, they're all in there. I can't see where you can justify taking this increase. You, you should be freezing the senior officers' level so that the lower down, if there's any wage increases needed um, and areas that you need to fund, that should be used there. Thank you. Right. Well, let me just uh, thank you for that. And I'll, I will reiterate, I absolutely understand people on low incomes. I said right at the beginning, I really didn't want to do this. But I do have to balance resourcing the constabulary, all the demand that's coming in and the other pressures. I will get it from both directions. I can tell you that now. I already do, actually. Uh, so I have to balance up the results of the survey. And actually, 55 to 45... Um, I would push back, that isn't 50-50, it's certainly closer to 50-50, yes. But had it been the other way, well, obviously, but it wasn't. And that's the biggest response we ever had. I hope everybody in this room responded, I'm sure you all did, and I hope you all told lots of other people. Now, I don't know, but the reality is that's what we've got, the best response. All district councils and the county council and borough councils were all notified. I don't know whether everybody responded or not. I've got no means of telling. But we put it out to Salk, well, Sandra could tell you more, we really, really pushed out all the, everything we could. But please remember, before you make a decision like this, we only get our settlement a few days before Christmas. So trying to plan ahead, it's a bonkers system, but it's been like that for years under all governments. Utterly ridiculous. You'd never run a business like that, but maybe that's part of the problem, none of them ever have. Um, but there we are. As regards the pay rise, actually, and of course, please remember, a bit of public support here wouldn't go amiss, the police do not go on strike. A lot of people forget that, and um, I've got my own views about emergency services going on strike, but um, that's not for here. But please remember that, so supporting them is important. On average, it was a 5% pay rise, but in actual fact, it was a flat rate of 1,900 quid for all. So those at the lower end of the pay scales got, on a percentage-wise, much more than those higher up. As regards senior officers, that doesn't have anything much to do with it. There's a senior officer pay review body that sits separately. The same applied to the police staff, who actually have not gone on strike. Many of them are in unison. They've accepted the 5% with the £1,900 at lower levels as a flat rate. So to be fair to the workforce, very fair to them, they've taken that and they've done it. And we all know what the rates of inflation are. I did mention earlier, as far as I'm aware, the benefit system actually that goes up by 10.1%, I think, in April. So, yes, of course I feel sympathetic to people who, who have got humble means or less fortunate. Of course I do. But we mentioned the council tax reduction scheme, and I know Baber is supporting that. We've done that in Mid-Suffolk and elsewhere. Well, that will help. 
the added benefits you've got, what we've done from public sector leaders. So putting that all into the balance, that's why, actually, I have decided, did decide, that is what I'm recommending. It's well below the rate of inflation. I know there's been quite a lot of increases in the last few years. I am also very well aware of that. The difficulty here is it's a sleight of hand by government. I don't particularly care what colour they are. The reality is they put the burden back onto the local taxpayer. Now, what am I supposed to do? So this is why we've come up with that. Now, I can't control what the Home Office does or what the government does. We can lobby. We've been doing that for years. But we all know under successive governments, Suffolk has always had a very poor settlement, not just for policing, but nearly everything else that comes from the National Exchequer and the recent um, awards of funding for various projects where we missed out wholesale, for whatever reason, and I can't comment on that. Um, so we've got to look at all these things in the round. I mentioned earlier the extra pressure, and as I say, once again, we've had to employ four extra people just because of the Crown Court backlog. Now, I can't in all honesty say we're just going to ignore that. There are all sorts of issues with the uh, criminal justice system that I can't here and now deal with. So I understand where you're coming from. I agree with you. But on the other hand, I also have to say, um, yeah, you're in a, in a class stick. But that's why we put forward the 6% rise. And of course, yes, it's £15 for a band D. On a band A and B, you've got it in your papers there. It is that much less. So 20 pence a week. Um, yes, it's all, any rise is unwelcome, but that's why I've done it. So I really do hope you can support this. I Thank hope you. we've given a good explanation of what yeah. we want to do. Thank you, Tim. I'm, I'm getting looks at some, from some people. I think it's 11.06. I think if we take a five-minute comfort break, I propose that we don't go to agenda item six. We'll defer that to another meeting, uh, and then that will give us about three quarters of an hour to try and come to the vote, because I still... I'm conscious there are still five people who want to ask questions. Are people happy with that? So if you can get back as quickly as possible, please, and then we'll resume.
could I ask everyone to return to the seats, please? the right one. Just while uh, Rob's returning to his seat, uh, we have spoken to IT. They've turned the microphones up to as high as they feel they can without getting feedback. So hopefully people will hear better. Uh, and uh, a point was just an observation that was just made to me, which was a very good one, is when we are talking about incidents that are maybe linked to the budget but are, uh, that have occurred outside this room or in Ipswich and Havel specifically, it's possibly best to refer to them as incidents because we are live and there is obviously court cases pending. So just be careful of the terminology and thank you for the advice I received on that. So we wouldn't want to compromise anything there. Uh, right, so if you recall we're talking about the budget. We still have six questions. If I can ask if you can keep your questions and the answers succinct but you cover the points you need to, that would be excellent. I've got, to, just to make sure, I've got Councillor John Burns, Eddie back, Andy over there, Inga, James Finch and James Lay. So they are the questions, the, those panel members who are asking for questions. So we'll start with you, John. Lovely, thank you again. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I was going to ask about a survey, but most of it's been answered and I, I talked to Sandra separately about the things I would like to see. Um, a couple of things, uh, I'll talk, I won't talk about the incident in Haverhill, but relate to it in the fa fact is it appears to be different to the one in Ipswich. But it also occurred to me um, that one of the problems is, and I know Tim is very keen about this, is partners stepping up to the mark, is the ability for the police to easily access CCTV dash cam, whatever it might be, where councils and others try to put everything in their way to stop it. And I've mentioned this before, particularly in, in, in Haverhill with CCTV and, um, you know, the fact that they, they monitor something like 500 cameras with often only one person. So uh, they may see stuff after the event, but not necessarily during the event. And I know the one, uh, the incident in Haverhill, I know by, it was more by luck than anything else that they actually saw something after the event. Um, and I wonder how, we can get the police and other entities to work better in that respect. You know, we have this ridiculous situation and the officers from Haverhill have to drive 40 miles to go and watch CCTV in, in Bury. That's because the council will have removed the ability to view that data digitally in the police station. So there's an example of what would save not only officers' time, but the fuel and everything else. So I think there's lots of little areas that could add up to quite a few pounds, shillings and pence, as it were in the old days. Um, so that's more of a statement than anything else. But I do actually have a, a couple of small questions for Colette here. Uh, probably Colette, anyway, I'll go through Tim initially. In the papers, um, I noticed there was £300,000 over four years capital on page 58, I think it is. Uh, for Sizewell C accommodation. Now, I know you mentioned Sizewell C earlier on, and I, I didn't know whether the, the S106 or SIL or whatever it's going to be will actually cover that cost, 
Um, that's one question. And also, I think it's on the same page, uh, Martlesham, we all know the, the planning application was um, not allowed. Um, there's £600,000 allocated over four years for that. It says re uh, review of site. And I just wanted to understand what review of site meant uh, rather than perhaps something, some action going to be taken. Thank you. So, um, yes, any extra issues regarding size, well, that will all be covered by a 106 agreement. So it's in there, but obviously we're not at liberty to publish the 106 agreement. So rest, be relaxed about that. Um, we're certainly on the case. As regards headquarters, yeah, we haven't got the um, planning permission, and um, the reason we wanted to go for planning permission was to deal with the issues about restrictive covenants and so on and we needed to know whether we could get residential planning permission or not, which we haven't. So that after a very tortuous process and battles with the, the planners, that has now um, frankly been concluded. So that's that one. But we do have, as I've said many times before, we do have a backlog of repairs and maintenance. Now, I know every public sector body says they've always got things they need to be doing. I'm well aware of that. But that's a very good example where we haven't spent money unwisely by not looking at it but we do need to look at the the heating and we have now got to decide what we do with headquarters whether we revamp modernize deal with it etc so that is there set aside in case there are things that we need to need to be doing to improve efficiency and operating effectiveness within a, what is a very old building that was built in i don't know 1975 or 76 and it does need some attention um so that's what it's for so it's not there that it's got to be spent or anything like that, but that is there as a reserve in order that we need to look at what we're doing. I, Colette, do you just want to add to that? Yeah, just to echo Tim's points really, that the, the, the capital spend of 600 grand that you pointed out in the Appendix B is over four years and we know we know we will have to spend some money on maintaining cage quarters. I think you mentioned yourself, the, the con well you mentioned the control room was, was cramped. There's, there is things that we know we'll have to do down the line. However, in that kind of capital programme appendix, I'd just like to point out table A are projects that have been approved by the PCC and table B and then future future years projects have not yet been approved so it's not like they're set in stone as to what we're going to do it's just prudent to set money aside to ensure that we can meet those challenges when they come lovely thank you um, councillor back thank you chair um, you've put forward a very very powerful uh, argument I think towards uh, the six percent increase um, but what would be the impact if the preset were not agreed in terms of operational resilience and staffing numbers? And also, what threats do you as PCC envisage for the constabulary and the community if the full precept is not agreed? Well, um, I couldn't give you a precise answer apart from a general um, comment that I think there would be a decline in service, a reduction, which I think would be very, very regrettable and extremely regrettable. So what we would have to do is to look at where we would make some reductions. I can't sit here and say where they would be, but bearing in mind you cannot make police officers redundant, then the emphasis would be probably, not definitely, probably on looking at staff reductions. Now, that would be very, very regrettable, a bit like a military oper operation. If you don't have the logistics chain and the support all the way back, then you've got a problem, as Mr. Putin fortunately knows, or perhaps doesn't know, um, if you get that the right way around. But the other thing that we don't want to do, and I really would be opposed to that, given that you can't make officers redundant, are we really going to be put then in the position that we end up with what you would call reverse civilianization? So jobs that can be done by civilians, you then end up having highly trained and expensive police officers doing, I think that would potentially be a consequence. That would be really, really regrettable. I have nailed my colours to the mast that we should, wherever possible, make sure that uniform warranted officers are using their powers to the greatest extent and not doing jobs behind the desk that civilians could do. I think that would probably be the main consequence on that. See, we've got to remember, if we don't have that extra funding, that's there forever and a day, that gap. It's not a one-off. And that's why I made the comment earlier about the legacy grants. We did as we were asked by the Home Office and the government 10 years ago. So that extra funding we got, but well, that has stuck at 6.8 million quid 
for the last nine or ten years. Now, if you look at the way, be it council tax or inflation or whichever, although it's been at historic low levels, it hasn't increased at all. So that's given us another gap. Those forces that did stick up their council tax or policing a lot then, of course, they're laughing all the way to the bank in some ways um, because that money that they put in actually has increased year on year. We haven't done that because I, by nature, do not like putting taxes up. But I also have to balance, as I've said before, Eddie, getting... With a outline, with a plan as to how you would use that funding. Yes. So the question is, is if you don't get the precept, what the threats? And you are now saying, well, if I didn't get the precept, there will be redundancies. But that, that precept funding is for specifically two projects. Am I correct in saying? No, no you're wrong. Because 1.3 million of the 3.9 million is for two projects. Sorry. Yeah. 1.3 million, i.e. 2% of the precept for the two projects, the other 4% is actually for maintaining the uh, where we're already doing. So if we don't have that and it's got rid of altogether, by definition, there could be. I'm not saying there would be, I did say could be, because I'm trying to be as helpful as I can, but I can't sit here and say there will be because um, that would be inappropriate. And you all know the HR rules and, and, and so on, I can't begin to do that. But uh, we would have to go away and um, come up with some plans. I, I think it's actually just useful to have clarified that point because people might not be appreciating that there were two distinct funding parts there. And, and, and so if I could just say, and it's really, really important to remember that HMIC report and the comments about we do not want to go backwards with the good rapport we have and the good reports we've had, and that if you like, the 2% the, the, the as opposed to 4%, that £1.3 million pounds enables us to move forwards as recommended by HMIC. And what will happen, ladies and gentlemen, if um, we had to withdraw that, we will get an earful from HMIC because, unfortunately, they never, all they do is say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Never once in 10 years have they ever come up with any sensible solutions as to how you would do it and recognise the funding and so on that they say. Anyone can sit there making recommendations, but the trouble is the feeling then would be in Suffolk, well, you haven't done what they asked, and there again you have another difficulty. So, again, please bear that in mind as well when you come to a decision. Lovely. Thank you, Tim. Uh, of uh, Andy Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was, yeah, that's a really important point that you just talked about, the 2% uh, versus the 4%. And taking into account that the 2% is roughly 2.6, oh, sorry, the sorry, 4%. Andy, could you just speak closer to the microphone, please? Thank you. Of course. Taking into account that the 4% is roughly 2.6 million, and you also plan to save an additional 2 million this year, in order to stand still, you need 4.6 million pounds. Um, one of the things that is really impacting the force, and I know that, Tim, you mentioned this in your initial statement, and I know that, Rachel, you've also mentioned this, is that the force is the last resort for a lot of services that are not our core responsibilities. Specifically, you've mentioned the Crown Court backlog. You've had to employ, employ four additional personnel. There are um, mental health support and even ambulance kind of picking up the pieces there. What steps can we take to reduce our costs um, by encouraging the the agencies who are supposed to be delivering these services to do their jobs effectively and do we have any power or control to um, to aid them or to hold them to account for that that's a really very good question and um, yes so we have a problem with missing children who are in care at the behest of social services I think they should do a lot more to look after them and if they go missing, sometimes they just go missing because they've gone off to see a friend, but we should not be the default position in the constabulary to go and find them. They have a responsibility and I don't think it's fair or reasonable to expect officers to do that. It's not to say, like Rachel said, they wouldn't go, but it's the handover in a quick and timely manner within, I don't, let's say, an hour, instead of having protracted delays and so on. Now, mental health, we are actually starting some good high-level conversations at last to come up with an agreement. Um, that's really, really important. Right time, right place. Um, that's been um, championed, actually, in Humberside Constabulary. I had a briefing on that um, only yesterday. We're going to be doing that, make no mistake, because 
it's tying up police officer time when they are not qualified mental health practitioners, and I think it's shameful that this happens. Now, we all know the problems with the Foundation Trust, and at long last we're starting to get some conversations, but you can't negotiate if people don't come to the table. Now, that started, um, that involves ourselves, the constabulary, mental health. There's a long way to go, but that is something we are really, really determined to deliver. No questions asked. It will take time. We don't have the crisis cafes here in Suffolk. Now, I don't know why we don't. That's not my fault or your fault, but it's not acceptable with the vast budgets they have in the health service. For whatever reason, I'm not going to comment on that, but we have to find a way of organising things far better and raising the profile of mental health. So work has started on that. We are still trying to bang the door for national highways, but they are an obdurate organisation that seems just to work on motorways. I think that is ridiculous. You know, the expressways, the A14, well, you, you know that yourself, A12, A11. We've got to get some support there for our officers when things, be it an accident, the road's damaged, sca needs scarifying, or whatever it happens to be, but we get no help from them, and that isn't good enough either. We then have another issue with children who are excluded from school. Highly regrettable, but who actually is responsible for looking after them? And those that get excluded, for example, from the pupil referral units. Why should the police have to go and do that? Clearly, as Rachel's very, very um, ably articulated, we're not going to walk away. But on the other hand, is it really the police's response to mop up all that when the core responsibility is keeping people safe, the prevention of crime and solving of crime? So this all takes it out. So we do need some more conversations. You can all help by saying to whoever the relevant agencies are, you need to come to the table, you need to work out a deal, and it's fine, as Rachel said earlier, we've got some money that has come back. Um, but actually, that still doesn't solve the problem of demand. It's compensation, but it doesn't alter the fundamentals. And that's what's got to be done. Now, all these other organisations say, well, they haven't got the money. When are they held to account in the same way we are? It's not done in the same way. So I can only explain what we're trying to do. I don't have any powers, but that's the reality. It would be... A disaster, I suppose, if children go missing and they don't get looked for. And in order to help with that, we've got a three-year agreement with um, SOLSAR, the Suffolk Lowland um, Search and Rescue. Volunteers who do a great job. I'm a huge fan of them, personally. We give them a grant for three years to put them on a, a sound footing. Just imagine what it would be out like without them. But, you know, the other agencies, why are they not doing it? They will probably say, well, I haven't got the money. Well, checkmate. So we're certainly doing what we can, but I don't have the powers. I wish I did. But actually, just instructing people to do this, that doesn't quite work like that. The reality is, how do we deal with it? So conversations, coming together, anything you do to encourage that, to say to them, and, you know, and those of you who are counsellors, you'll obviously know about that as well. We've got to come together to find solutions for it. And again, um, the last comment I would just make, with all the grants and commissioning that we do, we do a huge amount to support young people with different grants to support in the voluntary sector in all four corners of Suffolk. And I'm really, really passionate about that because they're our future. And if you set them off on the wrong path and don't look after them, it causes huge problems in the future. And that's why we do so much with things like positive, positive Futures, Inspire, Porch Project. Well, I won't go through all that because I'll be here all day. But that's what we've got to do. Um, really, really important, but it's a heck of a problem. But today, we have to deal with the here and now. That's the problem. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I've got. Has he? Yeah, yeah, okay, quick then. I guess, in summary, is it safe to say that if you were not picking up these extra responsibilities, that you would be coming to the table with less of an increase to the precept or? I guess it would be. Uh, well, I'm trying. I'm trying to understand why the inflationary increase is so great. Well, there would certainly be less pressure, um, without a doubt, because then you could reorganise resources to focus on the core principles of policing. Of course, policing is one of these things where demand is insatiable. There's always something else to do. You're never going to solve every crime, but you could make more progress on that with the resources that you've got. So, in many ways, you'll, that is a correct assertion. Yes. Thank you for that follow-up, Andy. Um, Inga, James, and then James Lake. Thank you, Chair. Um, as far as I know, the Home Office have, has specified a head of count target 
rather than full-time equivalent to enable access to grant funding, does this not leave it open for the chief constables to reduce the hours of officers, thus reducing the cost while still hitting the head count? As, as far as I, I know, uh, I have seen, um, the Home Office has specified a headcount target rather than a full-time equivalent target of officers. So that's where I'm saying, does that leave the budget or, or the um, power open for the Chief Constable to reduce officers' hours and that way still will have the headcount? You could argue it would, but I would be completely opposed to that, so no. We're not going to do that. We're not going to, no, this is about getting full-time officers, as simple as that. So I really, Inga, would not want to, it would be misleading if we started playing around with figures like that. So no, we're not going to do that. Um, now, we, we're on course, and I asked the Deputy Chief Constable, over 1,400 full-time officers by the end of March. That, that's there. So I don't think you need to be concerned about that. Okay. Uh, yes, I, of course, would love to ask you about things for Ipswich, but I understand that's not what we are specifically here about today. But, uh, Tim Passmore, you sat on the Health and Wellbeing Board, which I have often attended for years now, and put your argument forward about um, getting the more money for, from the different services that, you know, like mental health and so on, you know. So how are you going to put your argument differently in the future so you actually do get your share of the funding which should come um, so that you don't have to be the answer to anybody with a mental health uh, problem who feel that they don't get response from the mental health trust or social services where children go missing. How are you going to argue differently in future? As it happens on the forward work programme, um, Rachel and I will be coming to the March meeting, the Health and Wellbeing Board, specifically to talk about mental health and right person, right place, and how we're going to take that forward. The problem with the Health and Wellbeing Board is it's a statutory board with no powers. Uh, it's a talking shop, unfortunately. That's nobody's fault. That's the way it is. Um, I don't have the powers apart from persuasion like the rest of us, and maybe anybody involved in that, you can all help. So what are we going to do about that? I suppose the body of public opinion or views is helpful, clearly, but those are the only powers we've got. Um, and I don't want to be put in the position where we say, well, we're just going to walk away from it completely. I think that would be wrong, morally wrong. But it is about handing things over in a timely way, as I've just said. So that's the mental health one. Um, well, I don't quite know what we do. I don't have any powers to tell social services to sort out the issue of missing children. Be, and that comes up at accountability and performance panel. I think it came up at the last one or the one before. Um, they have a responsibility, so why are they not? I could be very blunt, say, well, your problem, over to you. I'm not going to do that. But why are they not actually doing more to make sure children don't go missing and so on, and if they're in care and so on? So it, it, it's about dialogue and persuasion. I don't know if there's, unless anybody else has got good ideas how we could do that, I'm not sure. But certainly any help that anybody in this room can give and elsewhere would be really useful because we need to solve the problem and I'm absolutely convinced, forget the politics, it's how do we work together? And that's the only way we're gonna get somewhere. And we do have to do it, I think, for um, the betterment of Suffolk as a whole. So we'll all have ideas. And even if we don't have, we don't have a magic wand, but at least could we start? So on mental health, I've already said to the um, um, ICB or whatever it's called, I can't keep changing the name, you know, we need some crisis cafes here in Suffolk. Now we've got the STEAM cafe that's just opened up in Ipswich, there's one in Lowestoft, run by Access Community Trust, and one in Bury. Great idea. It's not a crisis cafe, but it's a good first step. And that's a contract from the NHS. I don't know which department, but it is. Um, but it doesn't deal with children. Um, it's only, I believe, for, we went had a visit the other day. I think it's only for those who are 18 years old and above. But it's a very, very good start. So well done the voluntary sector. 
we wouldn't be able to do it without them, but we need to do more. So I will certainly be very, very supportive of that. Um, it's clearly not our job to provide grants to deal with mental health difficulties, but actually, if there are ways we can help and so on, we will do that, I can assure you. So that's one good example of where we can do something. Thank, thank you, Tim. Can I, can I just, I know I was at APP the other day. Um, so the headcount for the constabulary is 1403, but I'm aware, because I know officers who are part-time, who work in Felixstowe and elsewhere, so uh, you talk about a full-time equivalent yes. of 1403, but does that, what happens to those officers who are part-time? They must form part of that 1403, surely. Yeah, but that's why, you... that's why you put it on an equivalent basis to allow for that. Okay. And I did ask, if you remember, I asked the Deputy Chief Constable the temporary deputy chief constable specifically, and he assured me it will be over 1,400 um, by the end of March. I, we won't get into that now, I think. But it, I, I, I think there's some. But anyway, that's something I think you were going to. You've clarified that you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, James. James Finch and James Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to come back to the subject of visibility. I think a number of us have raised it. Councillor Gardner, Councillor Bridgman. Um, in terms of the survey, I think this is excellent. You've got the record response. Um, I had personal responses because I circulated it to every parish locally in my patch. And what is interesting is um, their view of visibility is people walking around in dark suits. Can I ask whether you have considered um, because I actually believe the two proposals you've got in here is actually making the police more visible and more approachable. And therefore, have you considered how we actually change the perception of visibility? Because I think is that they want to be able to say, if I say, here a policeman and they've got some concerns, they want to be able to walk up to him. But if this is a way is this not a way of actually trying to communicate what we're doing in various ways? I think otherwise we'll always come back to the visibility thing of walking around in the streets. I think there should be a balance. And the second part of the question is, as a result of this more efficient use of your staff of these two technologies, um, is there an opportunity of releasing some to actually have the old fashioned visibility? So that it's a balance. But if, if you can understand the question, um, that's where we are. And I think we have to move the perception of what visibility is. Um, actually, James, first of all, thank you for circulating the survey. Um, that's always very helpful. The more you get responding, the better. Um, well, the answer to your question is yes. Perhaps I didn't explain it clearly at the beginning, but that's exactly the sort of thing we collectively up here need to do. Yes, the uniform presence is, is important for reassurance and the visibility, but I also mentioned visibility online. These two initiatives will help. There's a whole variety of things. It's being visible um, in, in, the, in the modern age without being silly about it in all sorts of different areas. So the response, the engagement, that all helps. Even basic things like replying to emails so that someone feels, oh yes, we've got that in. And there's no reason for that not to be done. There's actually no excuse for not answering that. But these are the sorts of things that we've got a communications review ongoing at the moment. And Sandra's very heavily involved in that. And there's also, as we mentioned earlier, this review into county policing. And it will certainly take all those things into account. We're involved in that as well. And that will be dealt with later in the year. But these sorts of comments are really, really helpful. So it is a balance. It is looking at new methods. And I can absolutely guarantee that is one of the key things that we want to achieve collectively um, when this review is done. Thank you. Please Thank you, uh, James Lay. Thank you, Chair. I, I found the most remarkable thing to come out of this meeting this morning was that one third of all the calls that come through to us are not answered. Um, we wouldn't, you know, it's, it would be impossible to know why those people were phoning because nobody was at the other end of the phone to take, take the call. And, you know, dealing in life with 
sitting on the end of a telephone waiting for somebody to answer us um, puts the hackles up of everybody who's sitting on the end of a telephone. Um, there is one major reason why I would support this 30p a week on a band D house uh, in your budget. Uh, it, it would be that having somebody to pick up those one third of the calls is probably more satisfying to the public than even people walking around the streets because we, 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 will have, we will have more people who need our help at that end than we will have with people um, looking to see whether or not there is somebody policing our streets. Um, so I will support you. I think we can't move forward without more money. Um, and that particular area needs really addressing because we just don't know um, how difficult situations those one third may be in um, when they're sitting holding onto the telephone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. And of course, as we said many times, communication is crucial. And that's why with the demand going up for 999 calls in particular of 21%, that is enormous. Nobody predicted that this time last year, and I'm staggered. But I've given some of the reasons, as has Rachel, and um, that's why this proposal is, is so important and so on. We do have other things to try and help people so that not all communication is lost, things like live chat, um, emailing in, and others. But nevertheless, I think we've all been in situations where you want to call someone and you end up trying to melt the phone because you're so cross after 20 minutes, nobody answers. Um, yes, but maybe I'm a bit old fashioned on that, I probably am. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tim. and. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to try and sum this up before... Sorry, did you want one quick one? John? Very, very quick one. I was, I was just... One of the things we've had from a parish council or a town council level is tax base. Um, we all know during COVID it dropped about 3.5%. It then went up quite big last year, about 5% in our town. I'm not talking about your side. Um, and then last... Uh, this current year, we look, we're forecasting 1.4% increase, which is an interesting thing because there's a financial aspect to that the loss of income, but also the fact, as an example in Haver, who our tax base has gone up 109, but we've actually had 400 new houses. That's probably 800,000 people that have to be policed. And I wonder where, how that correlation between the amount of money you're getting from the taxpayer actually affects the on-the-ground policing with the demand aspect of it, because, and particularly a lot of those houses, um, uh, without being disparatory or anything, some of them will be uh, affordable houses. We've had quite increased ASB from, from those, which is a real shame. Um, life skills, that sort of thing, being lacking uh, in some cases where people by uh, housing associations have been chucked into those houses. And I wonder whether from a, an operational point of view and a financial point of view, whether there is any correlation between those. Thank you. So. We were asked to collect a comment on the tax base specifically, but of course that is taken into account when we set the budget. I think the assumption for this year is in the MTFP was one and a half percent, which I think, um, what do we get, is it about, it's in there, each percentage we've got all that. So yeah, that is taken into account, but of course, as I said earlier, policing is one of these areas where there's insatiable demand, there's always something else. So that helps, but then bear in mind what I said about audit fees, council tax reduction schemes that helps to cover, cover that. So, and we've got all these other people that need to um, be looked after. And of course, online crime, um, well, that's a global uh, problem as well. It doesn't respect any borders at all. And I think that's one of the problems with the funding formula, because as the pattern of crime changes, no account has been taken. So for fraud, I don't know, perhaps 95% of fraudsters don't live in Suffolk, I'm guessing, but I'm jolly sure a lot of them don't. Some of them are overseas, but for the victim, stealing pensions, all sorts of other things, financial transactions, personal information, they have to be dealt with here. And that's why I was implored yesterday, all of us as police and crime commissioners in one of our regular get togethers, you need that local dimension to help combat fraud. And in conjunction, of course, with trading standards, we mustn't forget that, um, how we can take that forward. We've got very good police operations at the regional um, the crime unit, Ursu. Uh, as well as nationally. So it's complicated, but it's something we've got to do better on as well. 
So um, there we are. Did you want to just comment, Colette, on, the, on, on that? Um, Thanks. Yeah, so uh, the assumption for the, for the tax base, um, we assume for this year, has increased by 1.53%, which I think we are getting confirmation back shortly from, from the County Council. Um, and we've assumed going forward for the four years of the MTFP a 1% increase each year after, and 1% equates to about 650k. Um, so it, it does obviously more houses, more council tax. We do get more money in. It's hard to it's hard to measure whether it equates to. Obviously, there will be a higher demand on policing the higher the population is, but it's hard to do a direct measurement. In my mind, what I was referring to was perhaps more the operational side. You've now got potentially a thousand more people in our town. Let's say, you know, we got we got uh, over the next probably 20 years, we got our town is increasing by 30 percent. Is are you likely to get 30 percent more money, if you like, to cover that cost? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was in the West yesterday. I spent the whole day there, and um, you're absolutely right. Of course, there's been quite significant development, particularly around Haverhill. Um, we are work. It goes back to the point of working really closely with partners. So um, Gemma was there from uh, the ASB officer from West Suffolk Council. Was in the police station at a meeting. Um, linked into police officers, understanding, building that relationship, what is that impact going to be on policing, but how can actually other partners work as well to manage that between us. That's what was happening yesterday, and we're ongoing with very much on the ground. That's the tactical at a strategic level. There's the operating model review that covers the whole of the county, because it's not just Haverhill. It, it's happening in other pockets around the county as well. That was last done in 2018. The picture has significantly changed. So we're looking at where the new residents are and big residence areas doesn't always mean big increase in policing. So we're then overlaying the demand on top of that and then allocating the new sort of police officers or reallocating the police officers across the county once we've got that data in. That's being analyzed at the moment. It will take effect from October going forwards, but it will be agreed in April. Thank you, thank you, uh, panel. Thank you, Tim and the Chief Constable. Uh, I'm going to try and just wrap this up before we go to the vote and uh, a summary of most of what we've heard. Can I think, on behalf of the panel, I would first like to thank Suffolk Constabulary for the, the level of service in the main they do deliver to the residents of Suffolk. Uh, I'm fairly confident I can say, on behalf of everybody, we know you are trying your hardest against a very difficult backdrop of finance, demand, technology, everything. So please uh, generally take on our thank pass on our thanks to your staff. Obviously this debate has been against a very difficult environment when we're looking at increases, when we do appreciate the cost of living crisis that many of our residents are, are facing at the moment. But what we don't want is a, to me, we want, we want Suffolk and Stabbury to continue to deliver a good service and to develop in the way it delivers those services in the future. And I was personally very encouraged by the Chief Constable's vision as to how they see this being delivered over the next year, to, well, next three years, if we say that. And I really was encouraged by that. Um, a backdrop of what we're looking to fund, I think we would all ask, and it was covered by Councillor Bridgman, Councillor uh, Burns, and Councillor uh, Gardner, is an outcome I think we would all love to see is there's greater visibility and accessibility for our communities with those officers who are delivering that frontline service. And I know it's difficult to commit to that, but I think that's the override, one of the overriding aims is our communities want greater accessibility and visibility where possible. And I'm not talking about a Bobby standing on the street all the time. We'd love it. I've done it years ago, but we appreciate we can't all do that now. But it, I think the theme is we want our residents to have greater accessibility. We know you continue to make savings and you're working hard uh, through the collaboration projects and through your own uh, work to continue to make savings. So I'm confident we have not got an efficient and inefficient police force. So I do rec uh, appreciate the challenges that you are facing and you're talking about the new operating model. Uh, again, that will hopefully deliver efficiencies, but it in hopefully confidence and satisfaction within our communities. So that's how I've tried to do, try and partially sum up where I think we are. 
We will now move on to a recorded vote on the proposed precept. Once we have taken the vote, I will ask members if they have any further comments or recommendations for inclusion in the panel's report to the PCC. Uh, can I finish there, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, well, uh, a decision to veto. Please note that veto the proposed precept requires three quarters of the panel's total membership, and that's nine members, to vote against the proposal. A, deci a decision to veto the proposed precept can only be for the reason that is considered is either too high or too low. The support officer will now ask each panel member in turn to switch on their microphone and clearly state whether they are, and I will come to you, Sarah, before we take the vote. For the precept, against the precept proposal, clearly stating your reason, i.e. too high or too low, or to abstain. So, Sarah, very quickly before we go well, to Well, I'm sorry, I, I may have misinterpreted the format of the meeting because I thought the previous part was questions and, and, and then we debate. Um, because to me, questions and debate are very different. And I asked a question, but I'm not sure I've contributed to any debate. Um, so I, I, if, we just, if we just go straight to a vote, then that doesn't give a chance for debate. But maybe I've just misinterpreted the structure of the meeting. Am I allowed to say anything now? Sorry, I, we normally, this is how we normally run these meetings, without the, we don't do the council question and debate part, but is there something you wish to say first before we... Well, well I, just, I just wanted to say that when I came to this meeting, I was, I was a little bit sceptical of the, of the higher um, rate of um, increase for the, for the precept, and I wanted to say that the the presentation about the two extra services that are being proposed with this extra 2% increase, um, I think has been very convincing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, that we don't tend to follow the model of full council. Uh, so, who's... You both are. So, when your name is called, please state clear, put your microphone on and state clearly what your preference is. Okay, so you're, um, you need to let me know if you are for the, pre the proposal. Hello. Um, you, you are voting either for the proposal, against the preset proposal, stating whether you feel it is too high or too low, or you're abstaining. So, Councillor Back. For. Councillor Beer. Against. I think it's too high. The 2% for the increases, I fully support you on. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bridgman. Four. Councillor Burns. Four, but I thought there was another option, which is also make recommendations. But anyway, yeah, yeah so just be right. I've got four, yeah. Councillor Finch. Four, the constable's, uh, commissioner's recommendation. Councillor Gardiner. Against. And is your reason that it's too high? I would reserve my comments until such time as we get to any other recommendations on the basis that we don't know at this point whether it will be agreed or not. Um, Councillor Goldsmith? Four. Councillor Jepson? Four. Francine Jones? Four. Councillor Lay? Four. Um, Councillor Lockington? Four. Councillor Mansell? Four. And Andy Stevenson? Four. Seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I make that eleven, four, and two against chair. Yes, I agree to that. Thank you, members, for every for your votes. Um, 
Do panel members now wish to make any further comment or recommendations to the PCC for consideration which will be included in the report? Yeah, I was Councilor only going Burns to re-emphasise those small things that add up to pounds. Things like I was telling you about the, you know, the 40-mile round trip to read, get CCT. But let's save a few quid here and there by not having to do this, by getting the partners to step up to the mark somehow. I know it's only peanuts in the scheme of things, but it, as you know, as a certain supermarket says, every little bit helps. Thank you. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a recommendation to um, pick up on the points that um, the Commissioner mentioned towards your summing up, which is the, the way that, that, that um, crime is changing, and particularly related to fraud, um, particularly related to the international nature of fraud, and therefore to see on question whether there can be a review of how your resources are allocated centrally because of the change of that pattern. Councillor Lockington, did you wish to say something? Uh, yes, I would like to support the comment that uh, Francine Jones made before because it suddenly dawned on me, you're absolutely right, if I get a knock on the cheek, it probably will show up, but I don't know about people who have a different skin colour to me. And I think that is so important that all, everybody is supported. It's not just me who are pale, uh, you know, who feel supported, but it's actually important that you all. The other thing that dawned upon me when you talked about the, um, uh, the first uh, CCD and, and people could send in videos. You need to look into that you don't get a lot of frivolous things sent to you because now people can upload things. So you need to find a way of looking at that it's actually genuine things people upload and not just something they made up. Lovely. Thank you. And Francie? I just wanted to say, Tim, with regards to other partners not stepping up and um, fulfilling their part that they play in keeping people safe, having worked in Suff you know, County Suffolk County Council and worked in District Council and worked for the police, when you work for the police, all your partners look to you to lead. And when you work in the councils, um, they don't feel like they have the power as much as the police, so they again look to the police to lead on things. And I think if you, it's the people who make the decisions, who are supervisors, senior managers, I think you need, the message needs to come from the CEO that the agencies need to be stepping up and doing what they need to do because this is how mistakes get made because there's not a clear leader in how decisions are made and they will always look at the police because the police is the first service at the public phone when they're in trouble. So no, absolutely, absolutely accept that and that's why dialogue, conversation, discussion with people need to come to the table. We will move forward on that. I'll do everything I can to do that and I know Rachel and everybody else is but that is about discussion. Look, we've got these difficulties. These are our legal responsibilities, statutory responsibilities. What are yours and how do we put that together? Because that actually is about the future of Suffolk. What I've called for years a Suffolk PLC approach, that's where it came from, because it is about joining it up together. And we have to do far better at that. And if there are mistakes made, that's the other thing, we need to call them out in a, in a constructive way, give credit where it's due, but not be too defensive. Nobody gets everything right all the time, I certainly don't. Um, and have it pointed out to you, then how can you take it forward better? And when I said earlier about learning from issues and mistakes and so on, or whatever has happened, yeah, that's true, but then how do you put it into action? We can all say that, and that is said far too much in society, oh, we'll learn. Yeah, we've heard that all before. And that's why I think the public get a bit cynical. So we have to somehow 
collectively come up with tangible approaches, even if it's pilot projects, I don't really mind personally, maybe that's a good way to do it. Better involvement of the community safety partnerships, I think they will have an increasing role. I'm not just saying that because you're over there, Mark, but with the reviews that are going on at the moment that we all know about, maybe they will have more opportunities, influence, and I think, again, that's certainly something we can improve on as well. Yeah, absolutely, Tim. Uh, I think Councillor Brisbane, Rob, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, just a quick one. Um, I'd recommend, and I think, like I said it earlier, there is areas of small improvements, um, that you continually highlight the balance. Because for us, I've got young people that will do the phone, love all of that. I've also got old people, same as you guys, feed it in, I haven't got mine, I haven't got mine. I think sometimes we've got them all, but we're just not highlighting the fact, or that maybe we drop one for the other. Um, what the Chief Constable said about what you want the money for, I did come here and maybe a little bit sceptical. I was won over, because all of a sudden you're putting it in words that, yeah, we really do need that. I would just, just have a little word for the older residents who maybe look more to the physical presence. We can have them both. I think sometimes it's just highlighted that we have got them both. Thank you. Just, just remember my mum, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Peter, last one from Peter. Very, very quickly, um, you, you did say um, during the uh, discussions and questions that um, consultation, can we, can we look at that of trying to get a better uptake? I, don't ask me quite how, but... Um, I think you did say um, more sort of meetings going around the areas and what have you, um, getting people to see you, say, on the market hill in our larger towns, uh, this sort of thing. Um, because I think that is important. Uh, lots of people do not answer these um, online surveys or paper ones if we still have them. And uh, really, I do think that we should try and find a greater way because uh, you certainly made it very difficult for me, for me today to vote. Um, I, I read all the papers and I thought I could see which way I was going to go but listening to both of you and you put forward the two areas that you do want to improve and I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, so I think if, if you could get that out to the public they won't come complaining to me uh, as much as the rest of us. So. Look at consultation, if we can, somehow. We'll certainly take that away. Um, as I said earlier, one of the big difficulties is, until we get our settlement just before Christmas, the, the, the window is very short. But, um, and I think, um, you know, Sandra's done a really, really good job on this. It's the best return we've had. I know it's only just over 2,000. I don't know what, for example, surveys done by the county council, district councils, but they don't tend to get to, to those levels. Unless you do postal surveys, well, then we'd be criticised for the money spent on We can't do that. So, yeah, but we can all help on that. As a, you know, like James said, he sent it out to all his parish councils and so on. Ones that I've been to, I've said to them. I know they've all... Um, filled it in or said they had. Um, so, yeah, and don't forget, we also have a lot of correspondence during the year. We have far more now than when in the old former police authority days. All of that is taken into account, I can assure you. We look at complaints. So all of that goes into it as well for helping to get a feel of what people want. And I think that's really important as well. So that's, we get an analysis every month of our, what we call the post bag, although it's probably an email bag or whatever they like to call it. Um, file. How about that one? Um, so now all of those things are really, really important. And uh, as Sandra said, all the public meetings that we do, um, all of that's taken into account. But we are clear that communication side, we need to up the game. You know, the constabulary, um, sharing it, like you said, Rob, didn't you? Bring it together. So we will definitely be on the case. Thank you. And I, I think to, to conclude, we've got some really experienced and uh, very very capable councillors around the room here who can go back to their relative departments and encourage the support and the challenge that we need to, to the organizations tim has highlighted today and i look at one of my independent members francine i know she's a force of nature uh, and i'm sure with with iskri and others they can also fight for for you tim and for this panel to say come on Let's not just ask you to hold these organisations to account, but we can do it as well. 
So thank you, everybody, for your uh, contributions to this and certainly to the team at the top there. I'm now going to move to agenda item seven. I think we've agreed we, were going to, we wouldn't have time to do agenda item six justice, and uh, Liz, has, we've sent her out of the room as well. So agenda item seven is the information bulletin, which starts on page 93 of the agenda pack. Information bulletin items are generally not for discussion. However, there is the opportunity for the panel to put questions to Tim about his decisions. If there are any further matters arising that warrant specific scrutiny, members are invited to suggest these when the Ford work programme is discussed at agenda item eight. Are there any comments members wish to make on the information bulletin or questions to the PPC concerning his decisions? I'm going to take that as a no and move on pretty quickly to, to agenda item eight. Uh, agenda item eight is the panel forward work programme, which starts on page 101 of the agenda pack. Um, agenda items planned for the next scheduled meetings of the panel are set out in the paper. However, this is a live document to enable the panel to be responsive to changing circumstances. Can I ask panel members if there are any amendments or additions they would like to propose to the Ford Work Programme. Sarah, and then John. Well, well we, we haven't had time to, to discuss item six on our agenda today, so does that get moved forward to our next meeting? Yes, it does. Yep. No, John. James? Well, I just feel that our topic on the 21st of March is very appropriate from the discussions we've had in terms of speaking to the community. So if any lessons we can learn from this debate can be included in those papers, that would be very helpful. I think what we'll, what we'll do is we'll remove response times because we'll then have two very heavy papers again, but uh, they'll be very useful and a good debate to have following this discussion. Uh, and can I also encourage you, and I fully appreciate people don't all have the time, the last APP meeting covered some very interesting subjects, stop search, coercive powers, uh, and I thought there was a good healthy debate with the Chief Officers. So even uh, we now, uh, and Tim and Chris are very kind in giving us a pre-brief for the APP and a post-brief. So this is the opportunity for you to either come to that meeting or to send questions to myself and Peter, and we will ensure those questions get asked at APP and they are likely to be the more operational questions that is difficult to ask in this environment. So I don't expect you to read all the papers, but if you have the opportunity to read one that interests you, please uh, give us some questions, because then we can uh, give Tim some questions. Um, we would find it really helpful if you, particular topics, obviously we don't want 200 questions, but if there are things that are, you are interested in, specific questions, uh, if you can't come along, just do submit them beforehand and we can, um, we'll always air them in public, read them out, as long as they're obviously not too long, and then give answers because, I mean, there is an interest there and I think that would help. So please don't hang back on that. Feel free to ask um, something suitable, particularly if it's a fairly, I suppose, involved subject that you want some fairly detailed answers to because. Um, Hopefully you find that helpful. Lovely. Can I once again thank uh, Colette, Chris, Tim, Rachel and Sandra for your, uh, your effort today and your hard work and certainly Sandra getting that, that data out to us last night. I know you worked late. Panel members, thank you for your uh, very yep. searching questions today. Uh, and without further ado... Yep. Could, Mark, could I just say thank you for your support. I know it was a difficult decision. I am very, very grateful for that and I really do mean that. So um, I just want to register, I am personally very, very grateful indeed for your support. Thank you, and without further ado, we have the date of the next meeting in the... Yeah, 24th. 24th of March, yeah, that's on there. It's been a long meeting. So at 12.13, I'm concluding the meeting. Thank you very much. They may now have to close live stream, just so people are aware. <laughs>